Three minutes after 10 is the time. I had a little moment there, I thought, was that a little previous, suggesting that in the course of the next 90 seconds we'd get the news uh, concerning the future of the BBC chairman, Richard Sharp. And then, uh, did anyone set a clock? Did anyone start a stopwatch? And there it was, um, just, just while I was rearranging my, my papers and, and checking the temperature of my tea in the studio, the announcement came through from from Thomas that he has indeed resigned. Well, what, he's still talking, so what I'm going to do is... Well, I'm not going to wait until he finishes necessarily, but I'll play you his statement in its entirety when it is available here. So we're just doing the, you know, we've got the razor blades out and the tapes and we're splicing the tape and sticking it together with glue and Keith's got the Pritt stick. And so I'll play you the statement in its entirety uh, shortly. I, I, I want to tell you something first, though. I want to tell you two things first and foremost, because this is, as you'd expect, one of those stories where I perhaps have a little bit more knowledge and even insight than I do on other stories. The first thing is that Richard Sharp's period as chairman of the BBC has been quite well received in much of the corporation, uh, up to and including other board members. And I mean proper board members, not people just put their um, uh, entirely to uh, pursue the conservative agenda, people like Robbie Gibb. Um, and the second thing is, which cancels out the first thing, is he tried to get on the board under normal circumstances and failed, and then somehow ended up as chairman after applying for that uh, from the building in which he was working for both Sunak, who I think was his sort of protege at Goldman Sachs, and Boris Johnson. So we're probably not just going to talk about Richard Sharp this morning. We're probably going to talk about Britain, uh, modern Britain, Brexit Britain, a place where Boris Johnson can put in charge of the uh, national broadcaster a um, a man who has helped him secure an £800,000 loan. We still don't know who the loan was made by. We only know it was guaranteed by a distant cousin and old friend of Richard Sharp. So the idea that this was even, well, open to scrutiny, I don't know what the correct phrase would be, is a little bit remarkable. Um, but the... I, I, I mean, the idea that this needed an inquiry when we kind of knew the facts is a little bit remarkable to me. So it's not a media story. It's much, much more than that. There are two other names you need to be aware of for context. Paul Dacre, the former editor of the Daily Mail, now editor-in-chief of Associated Newspapers, and Charles Moore, the former editor of the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator magazine, now a baron, thanks to the patronage of his former protege, Boris Johnson, because Boris Johnson wanted to put Charles Moore in charge of the BBC. He wanted to put Paul Dacre in charge of Ofcom, and he ended up putting Richard Sharp in charge of the former. These are people who look at the media landscape in the United Kingdom and see a rough 90% support for their own politics, their own party, their own people, their own Brexit. They look at that. They look at the 90% support that they enjoy, and they don't think it's enough. So they want to take the actual areas of independence and impartiality, like the BBC or Channel 4, and they want to remould them in their own right-wing image. And then the tiny corners of commercial media, because Ofcom is uh, the overseer, the watchdog for commercial media, i.e. here, LBC, the tiny, tiny corners of commercial media that provide you with the detail and the facts that you need to make informed decisions instead of filling you with nonsense about trades unions, immigrants, people in small boats, refugees, the European Union. I could go on. I frequently do. The tiny, tiny little corners of commercial media where you are in with a decent chance of getting the truth. Boris Johnson and his mates wanted to put the former editor of the Daily Mail in charge of that. So that's, that's a power grab. That's a cultural coup. That's disgusting, and it's been going on under your nose in plain sight. Let's hear from the latest victim of the coup's current failure. Good morning. I would like to thank Adam Heppenstall and his team for the diligence and professionalism they have shown in compiling today's report. Mr Heppenstall's view is that while I did breach the governance code for public appointments, he states very clearly that a breach does not necessarily invalidate an appointment. Indeed, I've always maintained the breach was inadvertent and not material, which the facts he lays out substantiate. The Secretary of State has consulted with the BBC board who support that view. Nevertheless, I have decided that it is right to prioritise the interest of the BBC. I feel that this matter may well be a distraction from the corporation's good work were I to remain in post until the end of my term. 
I have, therefore, this morning, resigned as a BBC chair to the Secretary of State and to the board. It was proposed to me that I stay on as chair until the end of June, while the process to appoint my successor is undertaken, and I will, of course, do that in the interests of the corporation's stability and continuity. Let me turn to the events that are subject of today's report. When I sought in December 2020 to introduce the Cabinet Secretary to Mr Blythe, I did so in good faith. I did so with the best of intentions, and I did so with the sole purpose of ensuring that all relevant rules were being followed. I am pleased that Mr Heppenstall supports the fact that my involvement in these matters, as he states, was accordingly very limited. After extensive work, he states, his words, that he is happy to record that he has seen no evidence, and nor could he, to say I played any part whatsoever in facilitation, arrangement, or financing of a loan to the former Prime Minister. Now, during my conversation with the Cabinet Secretary on December the 4th, 2020, I reminded him of the fact that I was in the BBC appointment process. I believed, as a result of that conversation, that I had been removed from any conflict or perception of conflict. I understood this recusal to be absolute. This was my error. In my subsequent interview with the appointments panel, I wish, with the benefit of hindsight, this potential perceived conflict of interest was something I had considered to mention. I would like once again to apologise for that oversight, inadvertent though it was, and for the distraction these events have caused the BBC. For more than 20 years, I have devoted time and energy to public service, whether at the Institute of Cancer Research, at the Royal Academy of Arts, on the Financial Policy, Policy Committee of the Bank of England, or as an economic advisor to the Treasury working up to protect British business, including the creative industries, during the pandemic. And for more than two years now, I've seen the beating heart of the BBC up close. And for all its complexities, successes and occasional failings, the BBC is an incredible, dynamic and well-beating creative force unmatched anywhere. As chair, I have acted at all times in the public interest and for the betterment of the BBC. I'm proud to have fought for the recent return of government funding for the World Service. I've been active in commissioning independent thematic reviews of BBC coverage on touchstone issues. And I've championed the importance of the BBC as a well-funded and impartial public service broadcaster. To chair this incredible organisation has been an honour. The BBC's contribution to our national life is immense. Its people are hard-working and absolutely brilliant, and preserving and enhancing it really matters. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Sharp becoming the latest man whose entire life has been polluted by proximity to Boris Johnson following down that ugly, ugly path. People like Owen Paterson, Dominic Raab, I suppose, ultimately, and, and countless others, Pretty Patel. Although she, of course, didn't have to walk the plank, having been found by an independent inquiry to have been a proven bully. Dominic Raab, found by an independent inquiry to be a proven bully, only had to walk the plank because he was so arrogant and ignorant that he promised he wouldn't... Um, uh, not walk the plank. He would walk the plank in the event of being found to be a proven bully. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mention once more that my information, such as it is, uh, was, was that he was not a bad chairman. I, I don't know where some of the decisions that have been taken with regard to, for example, Laura Koonsberg on a Sunday morning having the editor of The Sun sitting in front of her in the middle of the Jeremy Clarkson scandal and not asking her a single question about the Jeremy Clarkson scandal. You remember the, the, the one where he said that he wanted to personally throw excrement at the uh, the king's daughter-in-law. That's perfectly normal behaviour. Shortly after, he'd had lunch with the king's wife, it emerged. Uh, a little later in the day. So plenty there to get your teeth into, but but she chose not to. You know that Robbie Gibb, who is a fully paid up member of the Brexit battalion, you know that he has publicly and privately sought to frustrate the appointment of people, brilliant journalists, to senior positions uh, because he objected to things they'd written on Twitter or jobs they had done outside the BBC. I don't know where Richard Sharp stood on that sort of thing, but I do know this. He is another man whose proximity to Boris Johnson has cast a long and permanent shadow over his life. The mention there of, of public service is fair. You know, if you make a time 
ton of money. It's a little bit medieval for my money. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of with um, an Irene Bevin on this one. Just pay more tax. But a lot of people who've got who are ended up richer than Croesus do decide to sort of salve their consciences or their innate sense of the utter inequality that's delivered the kind of wealth they enjoy by going to work for charities or by doing by doing good works. It's it's a bit why Victorian entrepreneurs opened children's homes, it's uh, at, at workhouses and and built you know sanitariums for their crippled workforce. So I, I get that, but my goodness me. Today's conversation could be about so many different things. Are you bored of Boris Johnson? This is his, still his legacy. Everything he touched turned to... I can't say that word on the radio, but whatever the opposite of the Midas touches, every single thing he touches, including, of course, our country, but many people are still not ready to recognise that. And crucially, this attempt, this power grab, this absolutely blatant and transparent attempt to sell Channel 4 to populate the BBC with their own people, <laughs> to put their own people in charge of commercial broadcasting organisations, everything from, from little old me right through to the Capital Breakfast Show, uh, and, and also, of course, to put their own people in charge of the BBC. And when the first one failed, up popped this fellow, who'd already um, seen his attempts to get onto the board, come to absolutely nothing during what you have to presume was a more independent appointment process. It's coming up to quarter past ten. We'll speak shortly to the chap who broke this story um, and the uh, remaining, the lingering problem that we have with the question of who actually guaranteed Boris Johnson's loan. That's an £800,000 loan arrangement at a time when 30p Lee was accusing nurses of not being able to manage their finances effectively and lying when they said that they needed to use food banks. That's modern Britain. It's one of those moments, isn't it? One of those moments where you really notice where we are. You've got a deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, a man who, frankly, to call him as thick as mince would be a grave disservice to the versatility and deliciousness of mince. He will accuse nurses of not of lying, really, about the necessity of using food banks because they're really just victims of their own poor financial management, while bending the knee and licking whipped cream out of the navel of a man who needed an £800,000 loan arrangement simply to keep his various ships afloat while enjoying a prime ministerial salary in excess of £140,000. That's Brexit Britain. That's Boris Johnson. I'm going to open up the phone lines. Um, 0345 6060973 is the number you need. It's a weird one, this. It's a huge story. It's a very big deal. It is, however, not an obvious phone-in subject. So I'm going to do something I don't do very often, and I'm just going to ask you to do what I've just done and tell me what this tells you about who we are and where we are, and possibly even where we're going. 0345 973 I could go with the faecal touch, but it's not a phrase that I'm going to deploy frequently in the course of this morning's programme. I, I, as ever, at the moment, in this weird little interregnum, I would love to hear from people who, who were or even perhaps still are Boris Johnson fans. There'll be plenty of it in tomorrow's newspapers, but you, you can't hire someone, you can't put someone <laughs> in a massive job who's just helped you secure an £800,000 loan that nobody knows about. I, it's so bloody obvious. I can't believe it needs to be said out loud. I, I feel a little bit sorry for Richard Sharp. I don't think he was necessarily dodgy. Whether or not he would have got the job in the absence of already being a crony of Boris Johnson and indeed a loan facilitator of Boris Johnson, I do not know. But my goodness me, the way that man thought he could do whatever the heck he wanted in direct contravention of tradition, regulation, expectation and basic common decency doesn't just harm us, it harms the people closest to him. It harms the people that he offers patronage to. It damages reputations, it undermines good works, histories, CVs. And now he's gone. Another one. Another Boris Johnson appointment. Departing from the public stage in disgrace. What do you make of it all? Um, particularly ex-BBC people, even current BBC people, although you may, you may have to use a false name. I, I, I sometimes wish I could show you my DMs from people who are still in the uh, corporation if you want to know where bodies are buried and, and, and where feelings lie. But my goodness me. A man who has essentially got one of the most powerful jobs in British media in the gift of a busted flush of a prime minister, having helped said busted flush 
uh, secure an £800,000 loan facility. This is the kind of stuff that is supposed to happen in banana republics. It's the kind of stuff that is supposed to happen in Soviet Russia. It's the kind of stuff that is supposed to happen in broken democracies. And yet it's happened here so incrementally, so slowly, so much in stages. I suspect a lot of people listening to this now don't realise what a significant, this significant story this is. Help them understand why this matters on 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It is 21 minutes after 10. Gabriel Pogrand is the Whitehall editor of the Sunday Times newspaper and the journalist who, in conjunction with his colleague Harry York, broke the astonishing story of the BBC chairman helping to arrange a loan guarantee of up to £800,000 for Boris Johnson just weeks before the then PM selected him for the role. Gabriel, forgive me for uh, 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 worshipping at the feet of a scoopmeister, but what was your emotional reaction to stumbling across or having this information put in front of you? I, I'm just interested in, in how much your eyes goggled. Well, um, James, thank you so much for your uh, generous words. I mean, I would say the main reaction I felt uh, over the course of this entire saga is sheer incredulity that we, the public, uh, weren't equipped with any of these facts at any point. And obviously it's great because the people concealing information, you know, creates a demand for members of our esteemed profession to get to the facts. But it's kind of nuts that nobody, you know, knew who was bankrolling the Prime Minister, who had underwritten that loan, and who had facilitated the arrangement. And um, it was obviously pleasing to be able to complete some of the picture if not all of it even in the context of modern british politics were you surprised that it took this long to achieve a conclusion um i, I think um i mean in in a way um what one, one could say um, I, mean, I, I don't think any of this necessarily flatters uh, the uh, conduct of public life or politicians mm. but one can say it's been a few months there's been an investigation it is utterly damning if you read it and somebody's resigned so um so yeah i i, I suppose probably the the bit the, the big most concerning uh fat pattern of facts is what happened originally C can i pick you up on the utterly damning because it's only it's only well almost seven days to, to the hour that i was processing dominic raab's insistence that he hadn't really done anything wrong shortly before i saw the report that insisted that he had are we in similar territory here richard sharp got his slightly exculpatory statement out before anybody has had time to um, properly uh, scrutinise the 49 pages of this report. I, I presume you've come closer to scrutinising it than most. Why, why do you use that phrase, damning? Well, I, I, what I would say is, um, you know, th this report had a pr pretty straight uh, and, and narrow remit. It wasn't to determine, you know, whether Boris Johnson should have taken out a loan while in Downing Street um, or whether, you know, Richard Sharp is a nice guy. It is very specifically, did his appointment breach the government's own code for public roles? And I mean, there is massive latitude given to ministers to put, um, you know, people they deem uh, fit and proper into big uh, well remunerated influential public positions but within their rules you know was this compliant and what Adam Heppenstall KC has stated is uh, on two counts no it wasn't he did not tell the panel which selected him that he'd spoken to Johnson about applying and secondly he did not tell anybody at any stage that he'd been involved in conversations conveying uh, an offer of financial support um, to Boris Johnson, to both Simon Case and uh, Andy, of course, discussed this with Boris Johnson himself. And, and that, Heppenstall says, is why, even if he wasn't involved in, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on a loan agreement, and it, and it is very clear that he was not involved in the detail of sure. the eventual financial facility, those omissions meant that it did not pass the smell test or indeed the actual rules. What, what, what is the role of the appointments panel? Does, does it essentially just rubber stamp the uh, desires of the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport or the, or the Prime Minister? Or, or, or can it sort of send them packing? Can it send them back with, with a must-try harder? Um, I, I suppose it, um, in, in the world of West, Westminster and Whitehall, there are lots of these committees whose you know, power is um, in, in part in, in the eye of the beholder ministers can choose to disregard their findings um, or, or you know submit to them and um, th there are these panels which provide a short list of 
candidates that they deem appointable it's a slightly strange word and mm. uh, is that person appointable and they'll put forward a few uh, but often ministers will have conveyed that they think that that person is appointable already so you know unless there's a massive reason not to much of the time ministers will will get their way and so so it applied here i mean there were actually reports in um, Rob, well, there was a robert peston actually in his spectator blog wrote that uh, people ministers were actually telling would-be applicants for this position literally do not bother mm. because bon- boris johnson telling anybody who listen this is uh, sharp's role already that was long before the actual formal process had kicked into gear and and, and in some ways I, I won't detain you much longer i know you're very much in demand this morning so i'm, I'm grateful for for, for, pleasure, for you pleasure. prioritizing us but the, the it's not over is it because the key word is guarantor he got guaranteed a loan of up to eight hundred thousand pounds he didn't actually make it so we don't know where this facility comes from for a man who was serving as prime minister at the time i i, I it is uh, almost unbelievable i mean just there are outstanding questions. Number one, Sam Blythe, Boris Johnson's guarantor, um, this cousin of his, who, for reasons that have never been enumerated, had to be introduced to Johnson by Sharp. He was involved in talks himself about becoming the chief executive of uh, the British Council. We've never seen any formal scrutiny or account of what happened there. And then, you know, most centrally, as you noted, OK, so Blythe was basically the financial backstop if Johnson you know the bank mm. called in or if the lender called in the loan then sam Blythe would step up but who actually provided the cash and and that we don't know and i mean could you imagine if uh, you know in the white house uh, you know if it transpired the occupant of the white house was dependent for his day-to-day finances on an anonymous individual yeah. or institution i mean it, it is quite uh, difficult to fathom so that is a big question to which we yet as yet have zero information or answers do you think we'll get an answer uh, I, I I wouldn't put much money on it. I, I mean, it's not, no, it's not I, currently scheduled for Sunday's paper. Then it's not scheduled. But if if, if you're listening to this and you know it, uh, my DMs are open. <laughs> so are mine, actually, mate. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think you know, Providence would probably prompt people to go to you first. Gabriel Pogram, many thanks indeed for your time and energy this morning because it is an astonishing story. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need to um, uh, offer up your thoughts on it. It's, it's not a morning hotly for, for pungent opinions because it is an indefensible situation into which Boris Johnson has led Richard Sharp, uh, as I mentioned, Rishi Sunak's former sort of mentor at Goldman Sachs. So much here speaks to bigger pictures. He's given £400,000 to the Conservatives. He was the manager, uh, the, the line manager of Rishi Sunak at Goldman Sachs. He is a friend of Boris Johnson. His donations to those mysterious think tanks or rather lobby groups masquerading as think tanks that exercise me so much almost every single morning, I think are probably comparable to his donation to the actual Conservative Party and, and the idea that you could sort of just think it was normal and acceptable behaviour. That's that's what I find interesting about it, the entitlement that's in place here. That the idea that... It, that's why it constantly reminds me of the corridors at Hampton Court during the reign of Henry VIII, where, you know, uh, great men of history, as they like to think of themselves as, look into whisper into each other's, oh, I've got this chap who may be able to and I just have a word with you. No need to mention it when you're up for the... For the for the Archbishopric of Canterbury, you don't need to do, you don't need to worry about any of this. And of course, they're given a free pass and even perhaps championed by corners of the media that, that pretend to have a fit of the vapours when somebody like Gary Lineker publishes a tweet they don't like. Half past ten is the time. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. 10.33 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. John Nicholson, um, better known these days, of course, as a... Was a particularly um, uh, robust member of the Select Committee for Culture, Media and Sport, but previously a journalist, not not just at the BBC, but also in this parish. And so well-placed, perhaps. Better placed than most this morning to comment on the departure of the latest BBC chairman. It is not the case, John Nicholson, that Labour governments or SNP governments don't also seek to put sympathetic people into, into, into positions of prominence, but the Richard Sharp appointment felt different, if not from the start, then certainly from the point that the Sunday Times reported his involvement in this still unbelievable loan facility. Is that a fair comment? Well, first of all, 
Um, you, uh, you're right about Labour, of course, because <laughs> Labour has put public service. Oh, right, the SNP uh, can't put uh, anyone in charge of the BBC. Can you think, out of interest, can you think of a single time that the SNP has ever appointed a donor to a prime public service job? I, can't, I, I mean, I, I, I lack the nous to know what the prime public service well, jobs in the in, in Scotland well, would be, I but maybe maybe the National Gallery or something like that. Well, I I, I, I can't. Okay, I can't. fair and, comment. And somebody somebody said that uh, to me in um, in the Spectator recently, and I wrote back and said, "If you can name one, please tell me." And they and they couldn't. Uh, but you're to the substance of your question, James. You're absolutely right. I think it's entirely wrong that big party donors like Richard Sharp, who'd given £600,000 to the Tory party, should then be rewarded with prime public service uh, jobs. Now, Richard Sharp previously applied, um, uh, applied for a job at the BBC. He wasn't even shortlisted. Uh, to So to borrow from Mrs Merton, what was the difference, <laughs> do you think, between the first time he applied, when he wasn't even shortlisted, and the post-£600,000 donation when not only was he interviewed, but he got this big job from Boris Johnson. I think we knew the answer to that question. Well, so I, I, I very much like as we take this forward, and I raised this in the House of Commons yesterday, I asked the Culture Secretary to promise that whoever succeeds Richard Sharp, because I, I thought he'd go, hmm. uh, would not have given a big bung to the Conservative Party. Uh, she refused to make that promise. And I'd like uh, Keir Starmer, now, if he wants to clean up politics, to promise that if he becomes Prime Minister, he won't give juicy public service jobs to people who give money to the, the Labour Party because it just sounds and feels corrupt. Well, I, I will put that point very directly to the Shadow Culture Secretary in approximately an hour's time. Um, I, I, not just on Good. your behalf, but on behalf of everybody else listening. Um, I, I, just pick up on that briefly. How, and this is where you're... Multiple hats will come in particularly helpful. How much influence could a chairman exert upon a corporation politically? I, I mean, I understand, obviously, the importance of the donation in context. Many people perhaps would quibble with your use of the verb reward. We don't know that it was a reward, but, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, I, I, of course, but I'm talking about what can be established as a actual fact. What, what role does the chairman play in the context of coverage that might be more or less sympathetic to a government to which he or she has previously, a party to which he or she has previously made generous contributions? I think that's a very fair question. The, the chair isn't an editor, so it, it's not like the director general who's the editor-in-chief of the BBC. So the chair isn't uh, calling people up to his or her office and telling them what to put in programmes or what not to put in programmes, as far as we know. But I think it sets the tone, doesn't it? It says what the government wants the BBC to do. It uh, tells the staff what the whole atmosphere is, the B is, is about at the BBC. So if you appoint somebody who's a big Tory donor, who's got no interest in broadcasting, as far as we can tell historically, uh, who's never worked as a journalist, and give them that job, I, I would argue, and I think, BBC journalists who contact me tell me it is a dampening effect uh, on the BBC. Now, we have a situation now where the director general of the BBC is a former Tory party candidate. Mm. The chair of the BBC until a few moments ago was a big Tory party donor. We have Robbie Gibb on the board. Now, Robbie Gibb was a spin doctor for 10 Downing Street, who actually had the goal to go up to Newsnight and uh, you're a a, a very um, a, a very eminent uh, ex-presenter of uh, used by, I was merely a, a humble reporter on the on the program but he had the goal to go to the newsnight staff and tell the newsnight staff that they had to be more impartial and to lecture them about objectivity uh, Robbie Gibb I mean, who are you kidding? I, I, so, I, and, of I, course, it, it reportedly intervened when they were going to bring back a former deputy editor of Newsnight, Jess Brammer, into, a, into an executive role exactly. at, at no, the, BBC. The, chair of the BBC. The chair of the BBC, when he knew that Robbie Gibb was doing that, he should have made it absolutely clear that it was completely inappropriate for Robbie Gibb mm. to enter the Newsnight office. Uh, okay. and, and an independent chair would have done that. that. That's a really interesting point, because you're saying that... It, 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 there may not have been an a proactive 
influence, but there is an absolute absence of reactive influence. So uh, Robbie Gibb is presumably thinking, well, I'm not going to get who's going to who's going to slap my knuckles. Hey, who's going exactly. who's going to wrap my knuckles? Exactly. I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's exactly right. And also the role of the, the chair, especially when public service broadcasting is under attack. Now you look you look at the Tories. Whenever I sit opposite them, so spare spare a thought. I look at these angry, raging faces. I mean, I, I, I was speaking one day and one of the Tory MPs actually started to growl at me. Literally, he made a growling noise as I was speaking. <laughs> these are not normal people that you meet in your everyday life. And they really hate the BBC. They really hate public service broadcasting. And I, I don't think BBC staff felt that Richard Sharp was a champion who would stand up for them. Uh, and we saw that during Gary Lineker, the, the whole kerfuffle over Gary Lineker. The BBC chair should have been out and about defending the BBC in public service broadcasting. He was in hiding. I, I just heard from Gary Lineker. It's fair to say he won't be passing much comment on today's developments in the news. But speaking about... I imagine he's, I imagine he's doing, um, he's doing a, 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 a dance around his uh, yeah. Bijou residence we, uh, we, somewhere. But uh, we can only speculate. see... Speaking of profoundly abnormal people, um, Nadine Dorries springs to mind. Is it, is it fair to say that if you are going to attempt some form of cultural coup on the few corners of the UK media that you don't already have in your pocket, then putting Nadine Dorries in charge of anything was probably not a genius move? I think uh, I don't think it's a secret that I'm not an enormous uh, fan of uh, of Miss Doris. She was uh, Secretary I, of State for Culture and Media as well. I, I know it's still hard to believe, but but this happened on her watch, didn't it? I think people uh, should be appointed to the role who have a you know vague knowledge of the subject matter. You should kind of know how Channel uh, Four is funded, uh, for example, if you're going to become the uh, Culture Secretary, and you should kind of not make up things about Channel 4 programmes. Or LBC you know, presenters. That's, uh, that's a basic uh, benchmark, really. Mm. We've, we've got to up standards in, in government. Uh, and I, I think one of those improvements we've got to make quickly is um, it's not giving jobs to, to party donors. Finally, John Nicholson, do you feel sorry for Richard Sharp at all? No. No, I don't. I mean, it must have been... It must have been it must have been horrible um, that these last few weeks. So at that level, you know, I don't like anybody to have a miserable time. But he had some chutzpah to think that uh, he was qualified for this job. And uh, there was always a sense of entitlement. I, I thought that during his various appearances before us, mm. he's obviously not used to being questioned or criticised. At one point when I was, I thought I was having a... Uh, a reasonable chat with him, but he started banging the table in what appeared to be rage and frustration. And I thought, you're not used to being questioned. That's not good. Might make a phone in host. <laughs> well, let's see what he does. Uh, yes, next. indeed. But there's a there's a there's a kind of pattern of public uh, service appointments from this government. They tend to be middle aged, white, entitled boarding school educated and far too close to the Conservative Party. Well, I, thankfully, I'm only three out of four of those. John Nicholson, many thanks indeed. The SNP MP and uh, stalwart of the Select Committee on Culture, Media and Sport, where he has very much been fighting the good fight on behalf of people who recognise the importance of... In well, everybody recognises the importance of an independent national broadcaster. Some people value it and some people despise it, which is why I thought it was relevant to bring Nadine Dorries and Boris Johnson into this conversation as early as possible. I noticed that I have Mick Wright on the line from Norwich. Mick, you may be familiar with, um, uh, tweets as Broken Bottle Boy and puts out a rather splendid blog called Conquest of the Useless, which has been unstinting on occasion in its criticism of me and colleagues. Um, he is a media commentator who has somehow managed to carve a niche for himself outside of the media... Um, what would you call it, or, or almost sort of symbiotic media it, where it, you, you sort of stop yourself from criticising somebody because you used to work with them or you like them. I, I love his work is what I'm saying, even though he has on occasion been caustic about me. So I'm glad to see that he's rung in and we'll, she'll talk to him immediately after this. Uh, 10.48, quick text, representative of quite a lot that's popping up in my inbox, both my work inbox and uh, 
Just checking the old phone and my personal inbox as well. James, I don't want to call him because I feel my voice is distinctive enough to be recognised, but I was staff at the BBC when Sharp was appointed. There was a lot of upset internally at the appointment, particularly amongst younger colleagues who knew his political affiliations. This coming after Tim Davey, uh, uh, who ran as a Tory candidate previously, had come in as well. There is blatant hypocrisy here. We're all lectured on impartiality on social media and not being able to talk about anything remotely controversial which in today's world is next to impossible for anyone slightly switched on all while the two most important figures in the BBC were known Tory supporters despite some of Davies good moves this is bigger than sharp it's about allowing anyone to run a supposedly important impartial national body with political and financial ties to government Mick Wright is a media commentator who as I explained just before the news has managed to carve out a, a, a unique niche at the moment um, where he demonstrates neither fear nor favour to anybody in the profession that he's writing about, something that's almost impossible for other people to do for fear of having, you know, nice little cushy numbers terminated or um, a cessation of invitations or a disappearance from people's Christmas card lists. Uh, I, uh, you can enjoy his blog, Conquest of the Useless, as well. And Mick joins me now. Let's start there, if we may, Mick, that idea that this is not unique by any stretch of the imagination for a government or a conservative government to put people they like in that sort of plum position. Well, yeah, I mean, I want to be a bit of a pain about it and take it right back. <laughs> Surely the, not. <laughs> no, but I want to take it all the way back to the general strike. Um, the thing that, um, in the 1920s, the thing uh, that we have a problem with the way we think about the BBC. Um, Tom Mills wrote a brilliant book um, uh, called The BBC, The Myth of Public Service, mm. which I, I recommend to anyone, um, because what we really need to understand is we talk about Reithian values and about John Reith, the you know, the founder of the BBC. John Reith put the BBC at the... Um, at the ha in the hands of the government during the general strike. Um, it was not an independent arbiter during the general strike. Um, other things have happened over the years. During, up until the 1980s, uh, BBC employees um, being employed were vetted by the security services. They say it doesn't happen anymore, um, but they would say that, wouldn't they? I say, I'm just trying right to remember right who, it, who it was that we interviewed. I wonder if Eleanor can remember. We interviewed someone recently whose career was going perfectly well at the BBC and then just hit a massive obstacle and they only found out years later that it was directly as a result of an intervention from the security services it'll, it'll yeah. come to we, me we just just after coming off air today i imagine go on we are operating in a country where blacklists are still happening my, my wife dr kate devlin who's a reader at um king's college london was prevented from doing a talk for the civil service uh, by Jacob Rees Mogg's little bully boy rules around yes. um, about politicisation. She was on Newsnight the other day talking about it, if anyone wants to see that. Um, but so, uh, what I, my point really, and what I said to your producer when I spoke to them is um, go back to, for instance, the famous Diana interview. Um, the chairman at the time could not be told about that interview happening because he was Marmaduke Cassie and his wife was a lady in waiting to the Queen. So, this is a problem. The BBC has a fundamental problem. Or go to look at James Purnell, the new Labour minister, who was then went into the BBC in a plum job after he ceased to be an, a an editorial, an editorial uh, job, not not just an yeah, honorific. And and exactly, Greg Dyke, an Greg Dyke, of job. course, a former chairman. So yeah, who, I who? I mean, present company. I think Greg Dyke did a, quite a good job in the end of being. But but yes. It's a problem. They, they cannot. Be, it, we have a history of politicisation in this. I think John Nicholson was very right to say Starmer, Keir Starmer, should uh, agree that he won't do appointments of um, Labour cronies, but he will not agree to that. Absolutely, he will not agree to that because the way our political system works is these little honorifics are very useful to give to donors. And since Starmer's come in, they, Labour has been boasting about how all the big donors have come back. Mm. And when they do that, they are saying to you, the public, hey, listen, it uh, doesn't matter what you think, these guys have paid us to, um, to do what they want, and that will be their priority. Now, a lot of people won't like me saying that. We need to get the Tories out, I agree, but I feel like... The BBC is going to have this problem under Labour as it has under the Tories now. And people are, are mistakenly thinking, oh, it's just about Tories. It's just about Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is a product of a bad system. He is not the cause of the bad you, you, system. But you are also, I, I mean, the, 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 nothing you've said is is, is incorrect. But, the lo but, but well, you haven't, I know it is. I'm not disputing that. But you haven't mentioned the loan. I mean, the, the, the circumstances of Sharp's oh, yeah, departure are, are very, specific, very specific. Very specific. Yeah, um, corruption. 
Let me ask you this. Uh, present company accepted at both ends of the phone line. What sort of character would you be comfortable seeing at the top of the BBC? Um, I think you, again, uh, Don has said some good things around this. I think you have to have a highly transparent, independent um, appointments process. Um, I lived in Ireland okay. for eight years. And, for instance, uh, the president of Ireland, um, Michael D. Higgins, has been someone who has contributed to p- uh, public life in that, in that country for a long time. You know, he's a poet. He was also a politician. He was also, you know, involved in setting up the Gaelic um, language uh, TV channel, the Irish language TV channel there. So there are people who have a long history in public life. We should have an open appointments process. You know, um, I would love to see someone like Samira Ahmed be the chair of the BBC, for instance. There are all sorts of people who've shown um, ability in journalism and, and awareness of how impartiality works, a commitment to the BBC. There's tons of people who could do the job. And we should have an open appointments process and all the documents from that process should be available to the public. And, and that would leave the, the, the actual appointments panel uh, much better insulated against the sort of questions and accusations that they may, they may, may now face as a, as a consequence. Of today's news. Let, let me let me run something by you, if I may, because I, I, I'm glad you've made the point about um, it, it being unfair to portray one party as being uniquely involved in this sort of behaviour. But I, I, this is from Phil Harrison, who, who, who's tweeted me just in the last few minutes, who writes about TV, music and culture for... A variety of organs. He says, I don't think it's possible to... Ch- I just wonder whether you agree. Because the minute you mention Samira Ahmed, you can hear Daily Mail journalists reaching for the word woke and, 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 and lefty and liberal. It would be very hard to find anybody who had risen through the ranks of culture in this country, culture and media in this country, outside of, uh, you know, the Telegraph and the Mail and elsewhere, who wouldn't be susceptible to the accusation of work. But Phil said, I I don't think it's possible to choose someone completely unaligned for a job like this. Most intelligent people have an opinion on politics. But picking someone who doesn't want to actively undermine the BBC for ideological reasons might be a decent idea. Doesn't that point put clear blue water between uh, Richard Sharp and James Purnell, for example? Uh, yes, but a former but a former government minister, while that government is still in power, should not have an editorial role in the BBC. That, um, just, that no, that, that, that's fine. But neither would he be a part of a a, 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 a group. And, and we would put Nadine Dorries in this. And if yeah, Boris Johnson wanted Paul James Purnell personally, just no, I, I understand. But it was it, it, there were questions that needed to be answered. I just read you this from Julian, who's in Dulwich. Your current speaker is a hundred percent wrong. Lord Reith denied Churchill access to the airwaves during the general strike because he believed the BBC should remain Not impartial. True. I don't Not know where true. this guy that's gets his facts true. from, but he's absolutely wrong on that point. That's not true. That's not true. If you go and read what John, uh, what John Reith wrote years later about the, it's not about Churchill having access to the airwaves. That's that's a that's a canard. It's about he he made it clear that the BBC would not act in a way that was contrary to what the government wanted to happen. Now I can tell you where I get my facts from. Go and read Tom Mills' book, The Myth of Public Service. Go and read the document. There is a there is a, an essay written by John Reith. About 20 years later, it's available to find. You can, that's available. So where do I get my facts from? Documents. A bespoke, so sorry about that. A bespoke reading list for Julian in Dulwich there. Thank you, Mick. Yeah. Um, it, finally, it was Michael Rosen, would you believe, who, who now, of course, appears regularly on Radio 4, whose early, early BBC career hit, hit, hit the buffers and subsequently emerged that he had indeed um, been flagged, if you like, by the security services. So um, factually correct there as well. Yeah, and um, you know, ultimately, um, I think that what we have to—you cannot have someone in impartiality, is sort of a myth, right? Yeah. And we're kind of tied up in the notion of impartiality. And you'd need to have another longer discussion about what does impartiality mean. When we but do, I think, we will invite you on. Uh, tell but people that. They... Thing, but what you have Go to on. do is show your biases. Yes. Show your biases. Be honest That's about them. Be honest about them. Tell, how can people find more of your work? I'm sure you've um, attracted some some uh, some new interest this morning. Yeah, it's, it's brokenbottleboy.substack.com. It's it's not actually a blog. It's an email newsletter. So. You get it in your inbox. You don't even have to bother trying to find a blog or anything. Um, so, yeah, thanks and very much. I suppose in the interests of, of owning your biases, I should reveal that I, I am one of, one of the paying subscribers to that email newsletter. Thank you. Mick Wright there from Norwich. Also, Broken Bottle Boy on, on uh, Substack and uh, Twitter. Uh, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I feel we should squeeze in a couple of calls from people who we haven't prearranged to talk to, um, which may involve straddling the news a little bit. But I don't think that this is 
well, we've been doing it for an hour now, and, and it, it, it's an important story, but I shall don't want to put too much pressure on Jim in Enfield or, 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 or Deborah in Birmingham or anybody else, but I, I don't know that there is a great deal to add to what we've already managed to cover. I think Gabriel Bogrand uh, was the journalist most closely involved in this story. I think John Nicholson was arguably the politician most heavily invested in this story. Mick Wright, for my money, is the by far the least biased media commentator um, policing that particular beat. Um, and dare I suggest that my own insights and experiences have been passingly passingly helpful in analysing this story. But here's a little heads up for you. Anybody discussing writing or covering this story who doesn't mention Paul Dacre, Charles Moore and Robbie Gibb is deliberately pulling the wool over your eyes. And that ability to pull the wool over your eyes is currently enjoyed by almost all of the UK media. It's not enjoyed by the BBC, which is precisely why Boris Johnson and Nadine Dorries and others were so keen to put people like Richard Sharp and Charles Moore um, and Tim Davey in Plum Jobs and at, at, at the BBC and of course Paul Dacre in charge of Ofcom which I still snigger inwardly when I say it out loud but that nearly happened too. Three minutes after 11 is the time. I got that wrong, I'm sorry. It, it, just, just, just because we've had a really good panoply of uh, it, 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 media and political figures commenting on this story doesn't, doesn't mean we've done the job. I want to know what viewers think. It's the blooming BBC that we're talking about, the one outlet which doesn't involve anybody anywhere making a profit and upon which we should traditionally be able to rely for impartial news. And, and I'm talking now to sensible people. I, I'm not talking to people who think that the... Um, that the BBC is engaged in actual propaganda, although I found some of Mick's historical points about um, uh, being in step with governments, very powerful and persuasive. I, 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 don't, I don't mean people who think that, for example, Fox News is reliable and the BBC is biased or that, that, that one is yin to the other's yang. I, I just want to know what consumers of, of news in particular and the BBC in general make of the current crisis because it is just crisis after crisis after crisis but if you have so many crises back it's a week since i sat here picking dominic robs departure apart a week seven days the deputy prime minister and the chairman of the bbc rishi sunak's deputy prime minister and rishi sunak's former mentor at goldman sachs both resigning in disgrace after being accused after being found guilty of unacceptable and inappropriate behavior should we stop for a second? People think, oh, he's better than Boris Johnson. I've said this before, and I'll, and I'll say it again. It's a bit like having a boss who's drunk. You've had a drunk boss for 10 years who, who turns up every morning absolutely slaughtered, urinates in the aspidistra pot, starts making disgusting comments to the secretary, uh, comes out of the toilet having forgotten to pull his trousers up. You've got Boris Johnson sort of I, I, just disgusting himself at every turn. And then the new manager comes in, and because he's not drunk all the time and because he doesn't arrive at work in the morning and urinate in the aspidistra pot and because he never comes out of the toilet with his trousers still round his ankle and because he doesn't make lewd and disgusting comments to the receptionist you think oh thank goodness for that he's all right how long has he been in the job it's not a year yet his, his deputy's gone for being a bully and his former boss at goldman sachs has gone for being dodge for not telling the people appointing him to a big job that the bloke who's put him up for the big job is currently enjoying the benefits of an £800,000 loan facility that is guaranteed by a bloke that he introduced him to. And all roads lead to Simon Case, don't they? How hard would it be? How hard would it be to put someone in post who was dedicated to the interests of the BBC, ergo the British public? Incredible, really, to reflect upon this somehow looking normal. Seven days! Out to check. I just said that. It's just a week since Rob. Feels like longer. A week. Bye-bye, Deputy Prime Minister. Bye-bye, former mentor and advisor. Because I think Sunak was the one that brought Sharp into number 11 Downing Street to advise during the coronavirus crisis. Is it possible, do you think, that Rishi Sunak isn't a very good judge of character? I mean, just off the top of my head, just putting it out there, random thought. Ah, uh, Suella Braverman, let's make her Home Secretary. Ah, uh, yeah, um, Richard Sharp, let's bring him to advise on... Uh, financial matters. Oh, Dominic Raab, yeah, we want to bring him back as Deputy Prime Minister. Absolutely. Bang on the money. You've got two of them gone now, and one of them so utterly uh, disgraced 
in public by her racist rhetoric about refugees that you sort of find yourself wondering whether perhaps this was the plan after all. It's not that Rishi Sunak is accidentally lending his patronage and support to unsuitable people. It's that he these are precisely the sort of people that he likes to have around him. Uh, a, a rhetorically racist Home Secretary, and that's not my judgment exclusively. It is, is also the judgment of Saeed Awasi, a former chairman of the Conservative Party and the first um, South Asian uh, a politician to sit in the UK cabinet. <laughs> and then you've got Dominic Raab, obviously a bully. I mean, even, even the most cursory student of human nature would know that that man was a, a close to unhinged. And then now Richard Sharp, who by all accounts is a, is a perfectly clubbable fellow, but seems to think that he's entitled to sort of fast tracks, golden tickets and special treatment all the way to the top of the BBC. The top of the BBC. I was a very good banker. So I think I'd make an excellent chairman of the BBC. That's a bit like saying I was a very good footballer. So I think I should be in charge of, the, uh, 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 of, of a nuclear power plant. I was extremely good at darts in my youth. So I think you should put me in charge of the London Symphony Orchestra. That's what goes on here. I was, I, I said, I was very, very good at tiddlywinks as a child. I made a ton of money as a scrap metal merchant. Oh, that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. Would you like to chair the FA? Or w w would you like to uh, come in and, I don't know, run the army? So there it is. You make a ton of money at Goldman Sachs, and somehow that qualifies you to be chairman of the BBC. Unless, of course, it's not the ton of money you made at the BBC. It's the uh, at Goldman Sachs. It's the proportion, the percentage of the money that you made at Goldman Sachs that you then subsequently gave to the Conservative Party. That is your qualification for becoming chairman of the BBC. And I love it because it upsets all the lefties. I haven't had those texts yet, but they're out there somewhere, bubbling under. Daniel Hannan writing in one newspaper today about why is it always the Brexiters that get accused of bullying? Two problems with that. Number one, they don't just get accused of bullying, Dan. They get actually found guilty of bullying in the case of Dominic Raab and Priti Patel. And point two, of course, it's not a coincidence. I agree with you. The reason why it's always Brexiters accused of bullying is because they are, like you, by definition, in the business of prioritising their unregulated emotions over observable fact and incontrovertible evidence. So they will, when confronted with informed, intelligent and calm people telling them that they can't actually have a unicorn or spangles for breakfast every day, they will have a hissy fit which is precisely how Dominic Raab and Priti Patel end up in the trouble that they're in. So if you don't want to be accused of bullying, or if you don't want to be found guilty of bullying, crucially, don't be a bully. And if you don't want to be a bully, stop pretending that black is white, up is down, and Brexit was a good idea. There you go, simples. And then the country can get on with the business of trying to get back to a semblance of normality. But no, here we are, watching a Prime Minister. Oh, he's sensible. He's not as bad as Johnson. He's rancid, man. Absolutely unforgivable the way he's allowed Suella Braverman and Robert Jenrick to, to denigrate our international reputation in the vilest way on the world stage this week. Do you know there's a doctor in Sudan who has UK residency. He works here as an NHS doctor. Uh, he, he, he has, if you like, a, a foot in both countries. They took him off a plane. He wants to come back here to go back to work for the NHS. That's his job. That's his home. This is where he lives. He's got residency. Took him off a plane. And Robert Jenrick stands up and says that it's refugees that are going to undermine our values. Unbelievable. Ten minutes after 11 is the time. And, and every time you look under one stone, look, here's a stone with Nadine Doris's face on it. Let's look under, oh my God, it's Gavin Williamson. Let's look under the Gavin Williamson stone. Oh my days, it's Dominic Cummings. Let's look under the Dominic Cummings stone. Oh gosh, it's Suella Braverman. Oh, it's Pretty Patel. They're all bloody awful, all of them. Unrelentingly, unforgivably, unbelievably awful. And then stories come along like this, twice in a week, two Fridays in a row. Deputy Prime Minister, not like Chief Bottle Watcher or Spear Carrier. Deputy Prime Minister, bully. Set the clock, ten minutes later. Oh, it's outrageous that that massive bully who everybody sensible can see as a head case has had to resign. Oh, it's a conspiracy. Oh, how dare they come after Brexiters, even if they're found to be bullies by independent inquiries that they called for themselves. It's, it, it's, it's madness. Oh, I can't believe they've got rid of Boris Johnson's appointment to the BBC. They didn't get rid of Boris Johnson's appointment to the BBC. They got rid of someone who accepted, applied for and got the job without mentioning that he set up, helped set up an £800,000 loan facility for the bloke who put him up for the job in the first place. And even now, even then, even after all of this, 
He still won't tell us who made the actual loan. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe Boris Johnson doesn't know. Doesn't strike me as the kind of bloke who would even ask. What's that you say? Oh boy, eight hundred thousand pounds spent. Oh, don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me where it's come from. I'm the chap who pretended not to know who'd paid for his own wallpaper. Remember, and it served me jolly well right up until the point that they chased me out of Downing Street with my tail between my legs because I lied about how much I knew about a sex pest, a, a notorious sex pest that I'd actually promoted within the Conservative Party. So don't think for a minute that these incidents happen in isolation or that they are separate or that they are unlinked or uh, extricable. This is all a consequence of two things. First, the massive lie of Brexit. The massive lie of Brexit, which opened doors for people whose only qualification for promotion was buying in and promulgating the lie. So inadequacy gets rewarded. Dishonesty gets fated. Absolute unsuitability for high office gets rewarded with jobs in high office. That's problem number one. And when the lie began to... Uh, break when it began to fracture when the truth began to get a look in what do they do they've got to get they've got to get they've got to get rid of the person who is letting the light in which is when Boris Johnson comes in to replace Theresa May one job and one job only keep the lie alive get Brexit done and then when he falls apart as he inevitably would not just because of the consequences of reality but because of the corruption in almost every fibre of his being, politically, personally, professionally. You can list it until a week next Thursday. Then you're left with Liz Truss because they cannot tell the truth. So these mad ideologues who think that prioritising profiteering companies over everything from health and safety legislation to the most basic worker protections is the way to get rich. They have about 10 minutes in the spotlight before they nearly drive the entire country off a cliff. And then who's left? Sensible Sunak, a man who was writing essays about leaving the European Union when he was still at school. The same school he was at when he gave that interview saying, I have uh, uh, aristocratic friends, I have upper class friends, I have middle class friends, I have working class friends. Well, I, no, I don't, I don't actually have working class. Well, round me up and give him a medal for being down to earth and in touch with ordinary working people and a king levelling up and the man to hang on to the red wall. What's that? Richard Sharp, his former boss at Goldman Sachs, not only got a weird sinecure in the heart of government, but also got promoted to the chairmanship of the BBC after helping to arrange an £800,000 loan for the most corrupt politician this country has ever seen. Yeah, that fella. Yeah, you can trust Sunak. He's a stand-up guy. He's sensible. He's not part of the problem. He's part of the solution. And all the people resigning, all the people being chased out of their jobs by a long, long record of misbehaviour and appalling conduct, well, they're the real victims here. And I'm Daniel Hannan, and I'm here to write an article for the Daily Mail about why the people we should really feel sorry for are the bullies, and not the victims of the bullies. I'm Alistair Heath. I'll write an article in the Daily Telegraph about the Remainer Mind virus that is responsible for the decline of a country in which we have won every single political battle of the last 13 years. General election, general election, referendum, referendum, general election, general election, won. Why has everything gone so wrong? Oh, because of all the people who think we're idiots. Really? Possibly. Just possibly. The people who've won all the political battles of the last 13 years, the people who've got their own way everywhere from the BBC right through to the civil service, the people who've uh, got Brexit done, the people who've taken back control, the people who the EU needed more than we needed them, possibly, just possibly, they're responsible for what's happening in this country. Yesterday, today and tomorrow. And the simple single question of how bad tomorrow will be is going to be answered in large part by how quickly enough people recognise who is really responsible for where we are. And I'll give you a clue. It's the people who put their cronies at the top of the BBC. It's the people who put their cronies at the top of Ofcom, or try to. It's the people who put their cronies in the cabinet, despite lacking enough wit to punch their way out of a wet paper bag. The sooner people recognise that the people running the country are responsible for the state of the country, the sooner everybody grown up, sensible and honest can start trying to undo some of the damage that's been done to the country under the guise of ludicrous ideology and cultish personality worship. It's 11.16. 
It is 11.19 and uh, I need to check the provenance of this, but quite a few of you are sending me evidence of uh, the inevitable finger of think tanks um, uh, in the context of Richard Sharp's story, including one astonishing claim that, that, well, I better not say it until I've double-checked everything, which I most certainly will. It's about half a chapter of my new book there, if it's all actually true. And, you know, even as I, even as I write this book, um, which is tentatively entitled How They Broke Britain and is about precisely the people that I was just kicking off about a moment ago, even as I write this book, I still sit here every day and marvel at the reality of what we've done, talking to Gabriel Pogrand of the Sunday Times and just going, we still don't know who made the loan to the actual Prime Minister. I wonder how many countries that could happen, happen in. He said, what's that, the Prime Minister? I mean, it's, it might be a bank, of course, but who owns the bank? Yeah, it, it is, I mean, just incredible. But anyway, here we are. Uh, and now the enormous challenge and responsibility of steering this conversation away from the media bubble and into the world at large, into the broader country, falls squarely at the feet of Jim in Enfield. Jim, what would you like to say? Yeah, how do I follow that? I mean, the, that ran... I, I loved it, I loved it, I've got to say. Um, but... You know, I, I, I love... But what you did, you stole you stole my thunder oh, no. in, in a sense. In a sense, because you know your your um, the uh, stone unturned, you know, yes. uh, turning the stone uh, um, kind of allegory metaphor yeah. or device. You uh, you I was going to do that, and oh. then you mentioned unicorns, and I was going to do at the um, that I was looking through the Boris Johnson's fantasy binoculars yes. at the Garden Bridge. God, and yeah. the unicorn was being variously ridden by different personalities: Jeff, Jennifer Akuri, yeah. uh, Martin Case, Rishi Sunak. Uh, uh, you know, Twitter. Simon so, Case. Simon uh, Case. <laughs> Simon Case. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Do, but, do you want to um, hear something funny? Uh, well, Br- briefly, and me, then I'll let you carry for, on. Only for, only for me. But I, go on. No, it's your so I just glanced. Show. I know it is, but I've hardly shut up since 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 about ten to <laughs> ten to eleven. But plus I change, Jim. Plus I change. I just glanced at Sky News, and I've got the subtitles on in the studio. And I thought, is that is that Daniel Moylan, one of um, Johnson's cronies in chief? You'll remember from when he was at City Hall. And the and the the, the interviewer said, to, "This is Daniel Moylan." One of the most ridiculous figures public life has ever had to endure in this country. And the, the Sky News interviewer said something like, does Boris Johnson pollute the reputation or damage the reputation of everything he comes into contact with? And do you know what Daniel Moylan said? No, I haven't seen it. He, so said, I don't, I don't... he said, well, he hasn't damaged mine. <laughs> 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 well, if you own if you don't own the sewage station, then you've got you've got shares oh, in the I sewage station. I suppose so. Then, and and then, however, then however bad it is, if he's put you in the House of Lords, I suppose you could look yourself in the eye every morning and still think you're a winner. Grr. Anyway, uh, Jim, fill your boots, can, mate. Can, can, can I ask? Can I ask just 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 one thing? Because in your in your you referenced your book. In your book, do you remember when you had the the where you questioned the hunt saboteur? Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, that's okay. my first book. But, well, I, I was a, I, I, yeah, well, I, I was a hunt saboteur for years. If you'd have asked me, <laughs> I would have turned around and I would have said to you, because I don't want the corrupting influence of a group of powerful people who are able to rip apart small animals for sport mm. and set an example to the rest of society and also terrorise and intimidate people who are in the local communities who are against it, trespass on their land, kill their livestock, kill their uh, uh, domestic pets. And so what you've got, what you've, what you've got is the, the BBC, which I, and I'm a licensed payer for over 40 years, sure. the BBC, after the 1960s documentary, which was brilliant, about um, about hunting, there was nothing. It was radio silence. The tumbleweed's been That's blowing through that debate for a long time. And because I've been there, I've been on the front line, I've had the beatings, I've had the harassment by the police, and also I've been able to give a bit back, I'll be honest with you. Okay. But the thing is, but the thing is, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, I, I, you know, your voice is so important. It's so important. And to have you to be able to say what you're saying, it's humbling because I don't know how you've managed to get there and to be able to be saying it. Uh, the only other thing, the only other place is private eye. And I don't, uh, you know, I, I love private eye. No, I don't too. buy it enough. No, it but doesn't it, the you know, you know, Rotten Boroughs. Oh, 
you know, like, it's all uh, there if you know if you know where to look. Jim, thank you for that. And and but no one knows what you're talking about because you didn't tell me you didn't tell them what the question was that you had such a brilliant answer to, which was to a hunt saboteur. Why don't you go after rent a kill? That was what I said, and it was yeah. What you, it, it was a pilot for a charity. I mean, we've gone off yeah, on yeah. a bit of a tangent, so we may, even for a penny, in for a pound. It was a pilot for a Channel 4 show 20 years ago now and because that Hunt Saboteur was so rubbish it didn't get commissioned that if you'd oh, been there yeah. that show would oh. have been commissioned and my whole life could have gone differently oh well oh, listen I've been I've been asked to do so many reality TV shows like Bray, Bray Winston who was a mate of mine used to say come down to BBC Jim and and he went down to BBC look what happened to him look at me I, you know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm I, you know you've I, done I've all right no are you sure? Yeah, positive. <laughs> positive, Jim. I look forward to your next call, mate. I really do. Thank you very much. Twenty five. I mean, to be fair, Jim was on hold for so long, like, uh, it's a miracle he remembered what he'd rang in about in the first place. Um, uh, but we go, on we go, from Enfield to Birmingham, where Deborah is. Um, uh, Deborah, what made you pick up the phone? Um, well, I, I, I agree with the other caller that you're... Fantastic. So we've got to stop voices. that now. Thank you, Sorry. though. Okay. Though, no, I mean it. It's um, lovely, but, but it, it, it's not, okay. not necessary. But, um, there are, as well as you, there are so many constitutional and legal experts that are really shining a light on um, a really dangerous signs of um, constitutional backsliding. That's a great phrase. Um, and it's constitutional backsliding by stealth. Um, academics have uh, written papers on it, I think, now. Um, and um, I think people don't understand that all these crises and all of this um, erosion of our standards and attacks on all our independent institutions is part of this democratic backsliding. How much of it do you think, because this is the thesis Mm. of what I'm working on at the moment, so Mm. I'll I'll nick your thinking, because a lot of it's accidental. It's not, they're not all meeting in darkened rooms, smoking pipes and talking about how they're going to do this, do that and the other. Someone like Nadine Dorries is is not exactly going to be responsible for anything that remotely resembles a master plan, is she? She just, she just hates we call it the truth or reality, or, or she quite likes reality TV, but she doesn't like reality. So how much of it do you think is, is, is deliberate? See, putting Paul Dacre in charge of Ofcom looks deeply yeah, sinister. Exactly. Putting Richard Sharp in charge of the BBC, for my money, obviously, uh, uh, I mean, corrupt, essentially, because we mm. weren't told about the money and we weren't told yeah. about the loans, but, but not ideologically. Yeah. He voted for Brexit and he's a Tory donor, but I don't think he's a yeah. complete head case like Dacre. Well... Um, I think just because he sounds like, uh, you know, he puts on this sort of decent voice. But Mm. if you hear him saying, you know, oh, my part was just limited and tries to excuse himself probably so that he, Mm. you know, gets a, you know, position in the House of Lords or something. Probably Um, You know, but if you think of that, and I thought... His part was limited in the same way as they try and excuse breaking international law. In a very limited and specific way. (laughs) Exactly. um, But that has very serious implications for this country and rule of law, which is what this is all about. When they talk about backsliding, there are four factors. The breakdown in the norms of political behaviour and standards. Well, we can tick that box. (laughs) You can tick that box. (laughs) Disempowerment of the legislature, the courts, and the independent regulators. Take that box. Take that box. The reduction of civil liberties and press freedom. That's a policy. That's a manifesto pledge. Well, yes. I mean, the UN Human Rights Commissioner has just said, um, has just called out the Public Order Bill Mm. as an infringement on our rights to... Yeah, but they're punishing us for Brexit, the United Nations. Okay. (laughs) I'm only half joking. Someone will come out and say that before tea time. Probably, yeah, probably Jacob rees Well, actually, if we want to go on to hang on, Jacob you haven't given me the fourth Mogg. one yet. Get back, get back, get back on message. Oh, What's the fourth one? Yes. Um, harm to the integrity of the electoral system. Well, we've just seen that with a four percent take up on the ID issue yeah, yesterday. Yeah, the voter suppression and also. Um, oh God, that's really depressing. That's all four boxes ticked in Brexit. I know, and Brexit the electoral Britain. commissioner has actually called out. Um, threats to their independence. 
independently of the story about photo ID, just just for clarity. I know I know you know that. Yeah. Can, can you yeah. recommend some reading around this? You mentioned academics have done it, particularly on those four points. Yeah, academic reading is um, Haggard and Kaufman. Okay. Um, and, and they pick written. up on this backsliding point and these four criteria for measuring it. Is that them? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I shall dig they, that out. They do it, they, it's sort of in the contemporary world. So they, they do it in the context of Poland and Hungary and other countries. And we are sadly, we like to think that we have a robust constitution. But, and sadly, I mean, people like even Tories like um, uh, John Major yeah. have said, no, it's they, fragile. Yeah. The constitutional units say it's fragile. And they the fear the direction of traffic. The rule of law they, say it's yeah. You're fragile. Right. And, um, you know, we are kind of sleepwalking. I mean, Lord Putnam, who was um, chair of the Democracy and Digital yes. Technology, I mean, he did a fantastic speech and resigned. You know, he I remember in the House of Lords. Yeah, um, because you know, he I, said we were sleepwalking I, I, into... I was with him. I was with Lord Putnam on the mm. morning on the morning that he got his Irish passport. Would you believe? Yeah. And that speaks volumes. I think uh, someone that, that that dedicated to the interests of Britain over a, a, an incredible career, stepping down from the House of Lords and relocating entirely to the Republic of Ireland. Deborah, you've made me a little late for the news, but I hope you'll call me again because you are clearly some someone from whom we can all learn quite a lot. And I, I'm grateful for the insights and indeed the recommendations. It's eleven thirty-one. So I've got the shadow Secretary of State for Culture, Media and sports on immediately after this. But first, Thomas Watts has your headlines. 11.35 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I'm going to go to Christina, who's in Chelsea. I want to talk to my colleague, John Sopel, of course, very recently of the BBC. And I've also um, got an interview scheduled with Lucy Powell, the Shadow Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. So I'm going first to Christina in, to Christina in Chelsea. There you go. Front of the pack, Christina. What would you like to say? Good morning. Hello. Um, I could do my own monologue, but you don't have to do so I don't need to. The one thing I need to happen now, though, is I need this to stop. The country needs this to stop. This is this. There's like a, an, an air in the country. They've got their tentacles into everything. Everybody's so depressed. There's no momentum for anything. Oh, the news is always so bad. Can anyone what? actually remember the last time they did something for the good of the country? Oh, yes, I can. Go on, please tell me, because I, I can't remember. And they got Brexit done. Oh, OK. And okay. they and, and the vaccine rollout? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I need it to stop. I and the CPPTPPTPPTP trade agreement with several countries on the other side of the world. I think you'll find that is a glorious achievement for uh, Team UK, Christina. You just yes, need... That is superb. But Thank can I make a suggestion? You can, yes. I, th- I, think we need, I think we need to all say that 12 o'clock tomorrow, we're all going to sit down wherever we are, stop our cars, stop in the supermarket, wherever we are, just stop and sit there till they're all out. I, I need them to go. I'd rather like that I, idea, like, like a toddler in the supermarket refusing. Yes. yes, I think it's time we all went full toddler. I've got, I've got John Sopel in the studio now, so you'll understand that I, 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 I must move along. But before I thank do, you. but no, thank you. Do you know what your problem is, Christina? Do I know what my problem is? Hmm. I'll tell you what my problem is. I have no. integrity and I want no, to be no, governed no, by no, integrity. No, 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 no. These, are, these are not the times for integrity and honour and principle, Christina. It's not going to change until they're out. And that's mm. all I can say. Until we, with the penny drops and they've gone, it's not going to change. Your nothing. problem is that you don't believe enough. Oh, but I do. I do. If you could just believe a little bit more, then Dominic Raab wouldn't be a bully. Pretty Patel wouldn't be a bully. Boris Johnson wouldn't be an utterly unacceptable candidate for Prime Minister, let alone a successful one. Dominic Cummings wouldn't be a liar. If you just believed a little bit more, Brexit wouldn't have hit our economy harder than a juggernaut going at 100 miles an hour. The chairman of the BBC wouldn't have just been forced out of his job because of the corrupt process behind his uh, uh, acceleration into that position. Dominic Raab wouldn't have been forced out of his job for being a massive bully. You just have to believe a bit more. John Sopel is here, formerly of the BBC, of course, uh, rose to the uh, lofty ranks of American editor during that astonishing period of Donald Trump's presidency. I I, I wonder, John, thank you for joining us. Um, 
Was there a point at which you, you, you looked back home over the Atlantic and found yourself actually thinking that the experience in America under Donald Trump wasn't quite as outlandish and as unique <laughs> as many of us originally presumed? No, and there are echoes of it. It's lovely to be with you, James. There are echoes of it today because I couldn't help thinking there was something slightly Trumpian about the resignation of Richard Sharp insofar as anyone who came into the orbit of Donald Trump emerged either diminished or destroyed by him. And you sense that something similar is happening with those who got too close to Boris Johnson, that it seems a good idea at the time. You're a moth to the flame. The flame of power attracts everyone and uh, all sorts of people were attracted. And they find at the end of it that they emerge diminished and I don't think it was on Richard Sharp's dance card mm. that he would be resigning from the BBC so soon after taking up the chairmanship of it and again the manner of it not going when the obvious conflict of interest is pointed up or when it has emerged that there is a question mark you know here you have a director general of the BBC saying we have to be transparent we have to be impartial how can he possibly have been able to deliver that policy mm. when you've got Richard Sharp in place as the chairman himself compromised? With this astonishing revelation hang, 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 hanging over him for months. It makes me think, uh, Trump obviously for the reasons you outlined, but also Cummings and Owen Patterson, the idea that they can... I think it's contagious. We can style out anything. It worked with Cummings. It nearly worked with Patterson, despite all of the evidence proving that they were bang to rights. But if we can, ju that's Johnson's biggest legacy to British politics, probably the idea that you can style it out, if not indefinitely, then at least until the next news cycle comes along. Yeah. Isn't there a slight sense of impunity? Yes, absolutely. And is. also, if I say something is black and it's white, it's black because I said it's black. Yeah, yeah. And even though you and so you've had to wait for this report to emerge today, which said, no, 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 Mr. Sharp, it's not black. It's white. And Richard Sharp has walked the plank. Mm. <clears throat> How much more honourable would it be for our politics if you had people who said, OK, look, this wasn't right. I should have declared it. I'm going. Um, stepping back to, to, to when you were there, just give us an insight into the, the influence of the role of, of chairman. I, I, John Nicholson put it rather well when he talked about Robbie Gibb leaning on Newsnight staff, securing the knowledge, again the word impunity springs to mind, securing to the, in the knowledge that he wouldn't get his knuckles wrapped by, by the current regime, which is a sort of, it's a sin of omission rather than commission. It's something that's not being done rather than something that is being done. Is it, is it a little bit tinfoil hat to suspect that a chairman can go into the BBC and steer the entire fleet in a new direction? Look, I spent you know 30 plus years mm. at the BBC. I saw all sorts of chairmen come and go, and they were invariably political appointees, yes, exactly. whether it was a Conservative government appointing someone like Chris Patton uh, to be the chairman or a Labour government appointing Gavin Davis to be the chairman. But I think that they saw their jobs principally and above all is to be representatives of the BBC. Mm. And I think that something did happen with public appointments under Boris Johnson where it became not are you well qualified for the job, but are you a mate who I need to pay back for something or who will do my bidding for me when I, I want to be tough with an organisation? And you've seen various public appointments. I was talking to a very senior uh, civil servant who'd been at the Treasury mm. who said we'd get these mad proposals for someone to be the head of this public body and they have no relevant experience, but they are a friend of somebody, uh, you know, a friend of the prime minister or the prime minister has made it clear he wants that person. And they would try to push back. And Downing Street would come back in and say, no, 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 we really want this person. I think that we've all got an interest in people believing that our democracy works and to have faith in people who are our public servants. And you just can't have that level of cronyism going into the appointment. And I don't think that did happen so much at the BBC before. No. Yes, they were pol people of a political shade, but it helped grease the wheels for the BBC to have someone who had the ear of someone else in government, rather than having somebody who was sent in with an agenda.
But you wouldn't see the, 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 the headlines on the news at 10 being influenced by a chairman, but you would perhaps see fingerprints upon the handling of the recent Gary Lineker case, perhaps. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know about no. that. I mean, the Gary Lineker case is interesting in that, you know, you had a chairman who was so compromised mm. that I don't know how much influence he did bring to bear because he was a sort of, you know, damaged goods and therefore, you know, Tim Davey, the director general, was out there by himself. But, I, you know, look, the BBC is one of the great cultural institutions of this country um, and it does need an effective chairman who can guide the ship. And I think that the role has changed as well. You are much more an executive chairman now than a non-exec chairman mm. and you play a much more hands-on role. Um, the BBC needs to get this sorted. The government needs to get this sorted. It would be impossible to make an uncontroversial appointment to that role, really, wouldn't it? Somebody somewhere is going to is going to have a problem with almost any name that you could conjure up now. Yeah, I mean, look, I think if they came out with James O'Brien, there might be people who'd raise an eyebrow or two. Um, <laughs> I mean, it might be quite exciting. Um, I, 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 yes, but I think that someone. What happened the last time round was, as I understand it, that Richard yeah. Sharp wasn't even on the shortlist. It is then becomes clear that he's number 10's preferred candidate. No other applicants need apply. And I spoke to one or two people who had been absolutely deterred from applying, mm. being told, you will not get this. If there is a more open and transparent selection procedure and the role of public appointments is open to greater scrutiny, then I think you can rebuild yes. the trust and faith which has been so corroded. Um, finally, Days Like Today is what your chart-topping, award-winning news agents <laughs> podcast was invented for, isn't it? Well, a bit, yeah. I mean, it gives us something to talk about and there is plenty to chew on over the way this has come about and some of the other questions about the civil service, the role that they've had, the scrutiny mm. that goes on, not just about the BBC, but I think there are bigger questions that you've raised here, James. Oh, and I also wonder, actually, finally, uh, genuinely finally, how much of the narrative of now, the, the narrative coming from the same people responsible for the, for, the, for the scandals that are coming along like buses at the moment, whether it's Raab or Sharp or, or anybody else, how much of the narrative of the civil service being obstructive or, or, or being biased is actually a consequence of them bringing reality to the table with politicians who are determined to continue some form of delusional I, I government. Think, I think the assumption in US politics mm. and British politics is that providing that everyone knows that they've got to behave in an old fashioned word like a gentleman, you know, or a woman or kind of whatever, you know, that there's, a, there's an old boys club and we play by the rules and then everything works. But if you get populists mm. who believe that they can do things without regard to normal process and procedure, then I think the system is really challenged. And we saw it challenged in America under Donald Trump, and we saw it challenged under Boris Johnson. And this is their kind of long Boris, like we had long COVID. We have got long <laughs> Boris. I'm having that. I'm nicking that. Very much we have so. got long <laughs> Boris right now. Indeed, we have John Sopel, whose News Agents podcast with Emily Maitlis and Lewis Goodall will be dropping well, roughly what time uh, this afternoon? Hopefully by four o'clock, five o'clock this probably afternoon. By tea time today. Thank you very much, John. The time now is 11.46. 10 to 12 is the time. Lucy Powell is the Shadow Culture Secretary. Her opposite number, Lucy Fraser, has... Um, declined our invitation to talk to us about the resignation of their appointment to the chairman of the chairmanship of the BBC. But but Lucy Powell joins me now. Um, can I start by asking whether you would pledge right now not to appoint a Labour donor to the chairmanship of the BBC if if it were ever in your gift, Lucy? Well, hopefully it will be in my gift at some point, uh, James. And I set up a an independent uh, review panel to look at the future of the BBC, how we can secure its independence, how it can thrive in the digital age and, and a range of issues. And obviously one of those issues, and we met for the first time this week, actually, one of those issues which they'll be giving early consideration to is the appointment process, not just of the chair, but of other members of the board and how we can ensure they are not just uh, independent, more independent, but seem to be uh, independent and that we can get the best people for the job and that there's a, a robust process uh, behind that. But I think, look, I don't I don't necessarily think that that should preclude anybody who has previously expressed a political opinion one way or the other. I think um, the type of people that you uh, are looking for for these kind of positions, you know, often have uh, had long careers 
uh, behind them already, and they may have uh, political uh, opinions and, and, and have had some other kind of political uh, involvement. That's not the issue here. The issue here, it's also not in the this question, case, with respect. Well, you were asking me I, I'm, about I, donations, asking me, not well, opinions. Well, do, well, donations, opinions, involvement. You know, two other, very other different types things, things. I think. Well, not not necessarily. I mean, and no, look, we all have opinions. Important... We don't all make donations. Well, and some people are, you know, more activist than others, you know, may have held political positions as well. That, that, that other people might find those sorts of things, uh, you know, not, not appropriate either. So there is a whole range of things, which includes uh, political involvement and, and, a, and a range of, of, of issues. Okay. But what is that issue here in this case is um, the appointment process, which uh, where the applicant uh, failed to, to make the necessary uh, declarations uh, through that and this report, the report that I instigated, not the government. This mm. is a report to me, which I received before everybody else this morning because I instigated it, found that he didn't disclose what I think to any ordinary listener of yours and, and others, I'm sure, was a very murky, let's say dodgy affair going on of helping to facilitate and secure a personal loan for the Prime Minister, who at the very same time, in the very same few weeks, was then appointing that same person to this uh, highly paid and very influential and important uh, public appointment. And um, and that's why I think he should uh, have resigned, absolutely. But more than that, he should have been sacked weeks ago because the damage that's been done to the BBC's reputation for independence uh, through what has been a challenging time for them over the last few weeks has had untold damage because of this sorry saga. And Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, should have sacked him weeks ago. And instead, he's hidden behind a report, uh, a report that I was calling for, that I made happen, mm. not him. Um, and as yet again, there's a I bit did, of did, a pattern emerging here. Yes. He's failed to actually sack someone when they needed to sack them. Well, I, I suppose we should compare it to last week's departure. And, and that, that took 24 hours. This one didn't take 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 as long um i'm glad you've drawn attention well, it actually it actually took weeks but I mean, i'm talking about the honest. relationship yeah. between the removal and the report not between yeah. not between the offense yeah. and, the, and the removal well, we didn't, we, we but didn't you did move very really quickly mean... lucy Paller. you on the 22nd of january the article appeared in the sunday times and on the 22nd of january you wrote to the commissioner for public appointments asking him to investigate the appointment process for the chair i'm glad you've drawn attention to that i think it's been overlooked by some of the coverage but of course we can't say with certainty that that, that, that rishi sunak himself wouldn't have also called for an inquiry as he did with Dominic Raab but these these are hypotheticals let, let me steer you back to things that we actually that we actually know um, and there was no suggestion that they were interested in in, in investigating sure. this at the time they were hiding behind that they were they were supporting him and you can see even from the statements that they've all issued today that somehow this was oh poor Richard Sharp you know he's, <laughs> he's found a sort of technical breach uh, in the thing and we're very sorry to lose you a very tin eared response from the government today already and I think that reflects that they have been um, asleep at the wheel, you know, and and not interested in this issue. They don't understand the damage that they've caused from their cronyism but they're, they're not, to they're, our much treasured institution like the BBC. But they're not particularly concerned with protecting the reputation of the BBC, are they, these no. people? No, no. Um, do you feel... No, they're not. And I feel they have undermined it uh, in a number of ways. And, um, and we've seen the pattern of that behaviour as well. Uh, from this government and, and from lots of Tory backbenchers and their friends in the media as well, um, constantly trying to undermine the future funding of the BBC, whether there is a licence fee or not, whether it should have a charter renewal or not. And in fact, we saw that from uh, Lucy Fraser's predecessor, Nadine Doris, who, who said only a year ago that this yeah. would be the last licence fee as we know it in a tweet uh, without even being able to come to Parliament and justify that at the time. So they've constantly undermined the BBC. And this cronyism and, and nepotism at the sort of heart of their public appointment has further damaged it, which is, which is why Richard Sharp should have gone a long time I get ago. that. I, I understand that completely. Do you feel any sympathy for him personally? I, I wonder because my information is that he was he 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 was he, he'd made some friends while he was at the BBC in in the role of chairman with program makers that he seemed to be a a firm hand on the tiller albeit that the provenance of his appointment became indefensible is it his proximity to Boris Johnson that has essentially brought shame upon him rather than anything he actually did himself 
Well, look, I think part of the challenge here, I mean, in a sense, I, obviously, I sort of feel sorry for him on a, on a personal level because the, these sort of situations, you know, are, are never very, very nice for you or your family. You know, mm. all of us who are in the public eye know that. But I'm afraid he's, he's misunderstood what he's done yeah. wrong here. He, he thinks this was a, a technical problem that actually he was perfectly capable of doing the job and he's done the job well and, and therefore it was just a technical breach, but he's fallen on his sword anyway. But actually, at its heart, the reason that we have these codes, the reason that the rules require you to disclose whether you have um, a, an interest, that, that, that a perceived or real uh, uh, interest conflict here, the reason that you do that is because should they come to light later on, they can cause a, a serious reputational risk to the organisation to which you're being appointed. Well, I, I, and that is what hap- And that is what happened. It is. It case. is what's happened. Let, let me pause it, you there. Let me politely request slightly shorter answers in the two minutes that we've sorry. got left. That's uh, that's absolutely all right. I'm just intrigued by that. I, I'm just intrigued by what you think happened. Is it a Scooby Doo scenario where they, if it wasn't for you pesky kids, they would have got away with it? If Gabriel Pognon at the Sunday Times hadn't somehow got hold of this story, then presumably the three or four people who knew about it, Simon Case. Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson's cousin, and and Richard Sharp would have would have just sort of carried on happily along. Well, they would have done, and I commend the Sunday Times mm. for doing some fantastic uh, reporting on this and, and really uh, very good investigative journalists. Um, but you know, but once it came to light, the damage was done at that point because the reputational. Yeah. Uh, fallout was so uh, was so was so great, and that was really obvious. So, so while so, yeah, so that's on that's on Sunak again. I, I'm going to try and squeeze it's in. It's on one. Sunak, but it's also Richard Sharp. You know, you should have known at that point instead of just thinking you could carry on. Speaking of Richard Sunak, he said he hasn't seen the report into Richard Sharp yet, but is unable to guarantee a non-political figure would not replace him. So he's on the same page as you there. Well, no, because I want I want to see a much tougher and more independent and robust process. And okay, I want to hear well, we, from we should keep a close eye on that. What that's going to and, be. and finally, G- Gary Lineker, who's found himself in the eye of several storms, not unadjacent to these issues in recent months, has tweeted uh, lately: the BBC chairman should not be selected by the government of the day. Not now, not ever. What do you think of that? Well, that that's one of the things that my independent panel uh, is looking at. And if that's something they recommend uh, to help restore... Who's on the panel, the BBC. Lucy? So we've got a, a very eminent group of people on the panel. Uh, James Pinnell, a former... Uh, Labour senior, minister. Uh, yes, but he also has spent 10 years, more than 10 years no, working know, at the BBC. No, I know, he's a former Labour minister. Uh, um, June Sarpong, a, okay. who was the former well, know, head June. of diversity at the B- B- BBC. Steve Morrison, who used to be the head of Granada yep. um, and has spent many time, a uh, long time experience in broadcasting. And Lou Cordwell, who is a eminent uh, businesswoman in uh, okay. Greater Manchester, who did a lot of work with the BBC up in the in the northwest and their digital transformation. I was told to wrap this and, by and they've 12. Got, and, they've got very, and they've got very strong opinions. So don't worry about that. They will be it's... making some very robust recommendations to me, I'm sure. God save us all from very strong opinions. Lucy Powell, the Shadow Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Many thanks indeed for your time today. It told me to bring that in at 12 noon. I'm only eight seconds out, which is a new record. Four minutes after 12. It is however you dice it. Remarkable that the government, never mind the country, has gone in the space of, what, two short years or less from clapping nurses to taking them to court. That is what Steve Barclay, the latest Conservative minister to face accusations of bullying, has been doing this week. Um, Successfully, it should be said, so the latest industrial action undertaken by uh, the Royal College of Nursing will be curtailed early because their mandate for industrial action runs out halfway through the next mooted industrial action. I can tell you that Unite, the union, has just voted to reject the latest NHS pay offer, which puts them on a different page from the midwives in England. The Royal College of Midwives voted, I think, yesterday to accept it. Um, The Royal College of Nursing have already turned it down. Members of the Royal Society of Radiographers also voted against it. The Royal College of Midwives said the offer was not perfect but was a step forward. And then we turn to the rail workers who are to strike next month after their union, the RMT, rejected the latest pay deal from train operators um, who operate, if you like, uh, below or under government oversight. RMT members will strike on the 13th of May, which is the day of the Eurovision Song Contest in in Liverpool. Um, 
uh, ASLEF, the train drivers union, also calling strikes on the 12th and the 31st of May, as well as the 3rd of June, which is the day of the FA Cup final. So this is really interesting and um, and important because I, I dropped another clangor, I think, last month, and I can only apologise. Uh, do you remember? I mean, it was right at the time, but... Um, I don't know if this one's for Idiot's Corner or not. Have you asked to speak to a Tory politician about this, or is it just Labour? Yeah, of course we've asked to speak to Tory politicians about this. A standing invitation to any of them, mate. So if you see one, just hand them your phone. Just don't tell them who's on the other end. Uh, Lucy Fraser, the current Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, declining our uh, invitation to um, uh, talk to us about this uh, removal or resignation of Richard Sharp. Um do you remember I said to you about a month ago that I was slightly surprised by the failure of the usual suspects to behave in their traditionally obnoxious fashion? Because it doesn't matter who goes on strike in this country. It could be firefighters, the people who you would entrust with rescuing your child from a burning house. If they take industrial action, then the Daily Mail and the Sun and other corners of the right-wing media will encourage you with a level of success that I will never fully understand to hate firefighters. If junior doctors uh, go on strike in pursuit of terms and conditions which were once uh, a prerequisite of their employment, an absolute st standard part of their employment, but which have been slowly removed and eroded since approximately 2008 to 2010, um, you would probably have taken about 20 minutes to be turned against them. It was tougher with nurses. It will probably remain tougher with nurses, but with railway workers, it's a piece of cake. Has there ever been an industrial action undertaken by railway workers that has not prompted a, an outpouring of the most vicious bile upon members and ad hominem attacks upon union leaders by every corner of uh, the British media that is currently owned by billionaires? Billionaires diametrically opposed, of course, to both public service journalism and public sector um, Workers, or pub, well, no, the public sector. Not that the railways fall into that category, at least the rail operators. They just continue to make huge amounts of money while insisting that they can't give um, uh, acceptable rises to their members. So I, I was marvelling at it. Do you remember? I was marvelling at it, the, this absence of the usual bile. I mean, it, it, was, it was like night following day. You could set your clock by it. Anybody at all in this country, whether public sector, private sector, or somewhere in between sector, anybody goes on strike. Front pages, uh, Daily Mail, Sun, Telegraph, the rest of it, start portraying them as the enemies of the people, uh, the end of civilization as we know it, communist agitators desperate to bring down Britain. He, I'm not even exaggerating. And it didn't happen. I was really intrigued by the fact that it didn't happen. But they were just biding their time. Silly old me. And indeed, sorry. Because what they do is ignore these people, whether it's the Royal College of Nursing or the uh, rail unions. And if not ignore, then make them offers that are unlikely to be accepted. And sit back and wait, twirling their moustaches, until the trade unions escalate their action, securing the knowledge that eventually, if they keep not giving them, not meeting them halfway, then the unions will be compelled to do something that begins to hemorrhage public support. That's the calculation. So what the right-wing newspapers have done on this occasion, presumably cognizant of how recently it was that we were standing on our doorsteps, hitting pans with wooden spoons and clapping emotionally for nurses, whether there were any on our street or not, um, they probably were cognizant of that when they thought, well, we can't really paint a target on nurses' backs just yet. And if we're not going to paint targets on nurses' backs, it's going to be tricky. I'll tell you what, let's have a crack at the rail workers, and they did, but Mick Lynch turned out to be one of the most impressive union leaders of the last few decades. And he, rather like a batsman, rather like a, a, a brilliant batsman in cricket, whatever they threw at him, he was knocking it to the boundary uh, with uh, Botham-esque nonchalance. Uh, but, of course, they bide their time. They bide their time and they wait for the unions to do something that is bigger than the last thing they did, that is more disruptive than the last thing they did, which didn't work, which is an escalation of the last thing they did, which didn't work, which is more likely to cause upset to the public than the last thing they did, which didn't work, which didn't bring the government to the table satisfactorily. 
And when they do that, then the government will bet the house upon a hemorrhaging of public support, which then gives them free reign to continue not coming to the table or to continue not doing, um, not meeting them halfway. And I think the calculation is that that is where we are now. However, I don't necessarily want to have a deep and informed conversation about industrial relations. I've given you my analysis. You feel free to pick it apart in all the usual ways. Most obviously, 03456060973 is the number that you need. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to focus on the railway strike on the 13th of May. We've got the, the footy one as well, haven't we? We've got the one that is going to affect the FA Cup final on the 3rd of June, um, which is going to be very bad for Manchester City fans. It'll be fine for Manchester United fans. They can just catch the tube. But the, um, the, the overland railways coming down from Manchester that would traditionally be full of City fans, that, that, that could be disrupted. Actually, I should check. Is that going to? Is there going to? The tube's going to be shut on the third of June as well. We should. We should probably. Can we clarify that? Is that all right? Um, I think I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on the Eurovision Song Contest, and I'm going to focus on the FA Cup final. Now, the kind of numbers involved. What you're looking at? What seventy five thousand people trying to make their way to Wembley. That's going to be an absolute nightmare. Uh, plenty of people come on coaches. It's not going to be impossible. It's not going to be empty. But if you've ever gone to Wembley on the day of a big match, for example, the um, the FA Trophy final, the very first ever competitive match to take place at Wembley Stadium. It, even that, which featured Kidderminster Harriers and therefore was far from a full house, uh, even that, they have the big horses out on Wembley Way and they uh, have, you know, the, the, the gates of the tube, the gates of the station shut so that you can... Um... Do you know, when you Google Wembley Kidderminster in search of the correct date for what that match was, it's such an uncommon juxtaposition. It gives you the details of... Um, Train travel rather than the historic occasion when Kidderminster Harriers were half of the first ever competitive match on the turf at the new Wembley Stadium. So I, I can't, I can't, it'll, it'll come to me shortly, the date of that. But the, the point is that this is now designed to do two things. I know I was teasing United fans, don't all, don't all turn on me. It was, a, it, was a, it was a poor joke, but a very obvious one. Um, it's designed to do two things it's designed to disrupt the lives and indeed the, um, uh, joys of Eurovision Song Contest attendees and FA Cup final attendees, but that's not that's not loads of us, right? If, unless you've already got your tickets for the FA Cup final or the Eurovision Song Contest, these are not strikes that are going to disrupt your life in particular. The second thing this action is is designed to do, well is to create an air of disruption. It's, it's, it's designed to do two things. It's designed to attract headlines and it's designed to give us a slightly more robust demonstration of the damage that strikes can do. And it's an incredibly risky ploy, which is why we're going to talk about it. It's an absolute knife edge, this one, of calculated risk. So it's a little bit like and uh, just turning up the dial slightly in the hope that you will sustain and retain the support of most people. And the very traditional argument from the kind of right-wing commentators and journalists who don't really care about anybody but themselves and their bosses but pretend passionately to care about you when there are Extinction Rebellion protests in, in, in the street or something. You can tell, you, you know, the kind of people that didn't mind when the Countryside Alliance brought London to a standstill but have a fit of the vapours when Extinction Rebellion do it. You, you, the, the kind of people who really just do the business of wealth and capital but have understood for a long time now that pretending to have the interests of what they like to call ordinary working people at heart is um is a good way to get clicks and clout and cash that that class of commentator that class of politician always likes to talk about oh i'm a great big fan i'm a huge fan of public protest but not if it actually achieves anything yeah, you, you've read these columns you've heard these people i mean oh, i'm a huge fan of public protest but not if it actually disrupts people's lives so I'm a massive fan of public protest, but not if it actually achieves anything. And this gives them ammunition. Make no bones about it. This gives, if I was built a certain way, 
uh, and I didn't respect you as much as I do, I would sit here pretending to be absolutely outraged on behalf of people going to the FA Cup, despite the fact that for most of the people writing about this in, in right-wing newspapers, they couldn't tell you one end of a football pitch from the other. Uh, I would be, oh, the Eurovision Song Contest, how can they be damaging the Eurovision? But, but they are given ammunition, and the ammunition is you. The ammunition here is you. It is the question of whether or not the needle of your support now gets nudged into the negative because you really like football or you really like the Eurovision Song Contest. That's the calculation. And I think, I think, Aslef and the RMT may be miscalculating on this one. I, I, I think to, to, to disrupt, they haven't lost my support. But of course, I'm honest enough to admit I'm not going to the FA Cup final unless I get a last minute corporate invitation, which I would very happily accept. I'm not going to the corp to, to the FA Cup final or indeed to the Eurovision Song Contest final. But I think that the cultural clout of these two events is such that it might make you question your support for these strikes. Am I right or am I wrong? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. The Derby's on that day as well. They've already rescheduled it. They've made the Derby a little earlier than normal in order to accommodate the FA Cup final later in the day. But presumably those stations, Tattenham Corner and Epsom Downs, TJ reminds me, are going to be pretty heavily affected too. And and there is a third element to this conversation, of course, which I should stress. Um, the phone lines are open. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need because the third element to it is the real risk is that the government uh, the gamble rather rather than the risk the risk is that they'll lose, lose public support the gamble is that the government will bottle it or the government will back down so the the bigger the disruption the bigger the threat the bigger the threat the bigger the risk the bigger the risk the bigger the gamble oh that almost sounded clever didn't it but it works. The bigger the disruption, the bigger the threat. The bigger the threat, the bigger the risk. The bigger the risk, the bigger the gamble. So what do you reckon? Can you hear your own support leeching away as you contemplate the disruption caused to either the FA Cup final or the Eurovision Song Contest or both? How do you, as a rail worker, as a union member, whether RMT or ASLEF, how do you feel about this specific date? Not striking in general, not, not industrial action per se. But these dates, is it going to backfire? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. And you know the legend by now. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 21 minutes after 12, Manchester and Liverpool, I, I mean, what you loosely describe as working class bastions, industrial powerhouses historically, and therefore probably areas where you'd expect trade union support to be higher than, than in some areas. And yet both of those cities effectively targeted by the railway unions with walkouts, strikes planned for the days of the Eurovision final in, in Liverpool and the FA Cup final in London, but involving the two Manchester football teams. So the risk that the unions are taking is twofold. It is supposed to bring so much pressure to bear upon government and bosses that the negotiations will reopen. And also the disruption, the threatened disruption is so great that... Um, that that pressure will become unbearable, but it doesn't. It's there's no guarantees. I just wonder whether this kind of calculation nudges your needle. Matt is in Manchester, appropriately enough. Matt, what would you like to say? Um, millionaire man of the people, Mick Lynch is showing his true colours now. Uh, you know what nudge? Is... You know what nudge the needle means? No. Okay, it means that it's changed your mind about where you were on no, this no. industrial. No, action. no. So it no, hasn't. Never... You, you, were, you were against it from the start and you're still against it now. I'm against people on a, a book way above average wages claiming poverty in the first place. I'm no, above... Boris Johnson had to borrow £800,000, didn't he, just to get, get through the day? I, don't, I didn't know we were talking about Boris Johnson. You're talking about talking people about... on above average wages who, who, who can't, can't cope on the money they're on, aren't we? I'm talking about people in the north who earn less than twenty thousand pounds a year for full-time work. Yeah, 
the the reality of these out of touch people in London. Mick Lynch is the, is swan. the out of touch person in London, is he? Does he live in London? Yes, he does. But let's talk about does RM. Does he earn over a hundred thousand pounds a year? Does he? Has he just insulted the people of the north? Which is yes, set by has. his members. Let's talk about RMT members who are on much smaller salaries who voted for strike action. So I, I understand. I understand the effectiveness of the invitation for for people who don't like thinking about things to focus on Mick Lynch. But let's talk about RMT workers on let's say twenty three thousand pounds a year who have voted for this industrial action let, let, let's let's address them rather than the man yeah, they elected yeah, the man that the man they elected as their general secretary so tell them they're out of touch and overpaid well I'm not, i wouldn't say they were they're entitled to do what they like they're entitled to strike but the fact that he's chosen these these particular dates yes and some of the other unions have particularly chosen convenient dates to be the most spiteful just shows how politically orientated these strikes so are. Most, these are the most spiteful dates. Well, I just think that he's not been in the news for a couple of weeks, so he sat back, weighed up the situation, and just thought, oh, I'll get back in the news again now. So, okay. You know, so, what I mean, describing trying to disrupt the FA Cup final or the Eurovision Song Contest as the most spiteful act so far, I just wonder if you could address people listening to this who've had quite serious operations postponed. As, as to why disrupting the football is worse than disrupting their health care. I'm sure they're already disgusted at unions anyway. They no, don't they, need, they ring don't. me in their droves to tell me that they support the industrial action, even though it's affecting them directly. So just, just, just a quick word to them on why messing with the football is worse than messing with their health care. The two things don't have to be compatible at the end well, of the day. That's the question I'm asking you, Mick Lynch is, Mick Lynch is well, your, your phrase was most spiteful. So, you know, most means more. More spiteful than actions that might interfere with health care or, or, or important appointments, crucial appointments. I just, I just, in your own words, why is the football more important than everything else that gets disrupted when industrial action is taken? I didn't say it was. You, did. said, you said most uh, spiteful. So why is it more spiteful to interfere with the football than it is to interfere with anything else? Trains and health aren't linked, are they? At the end of course of the day, they are. The Getting, separate... Well, football and trains are linked just as much as health and trains. You need to get to the hospital. You need to get to a football match, mate. The only difference is you can't watch the operation on the telly. So why is it more spiteful to disrupt football than it is to disrupt, for example, a journey to a hospital? The people who basically... Sh- in the health service. No, who've done I'm asking you what flags. your thoughts are. My thoughts on are why football every... is more important than healthcare. The, the, like I just said, they're not linked in any way. You may. How, how do I get to the hospital train. on a train if the train isn't running, Matt? You ring an ambulance, but they're all on strike, so you can't get one. No, so you, you don't. You day, don't ring an ambulance. You, def- you don't ring an ambulance for a scheduled appointment, Matt. Don't you, start it? lying, Matt. That doesn't help either of us. How do I get to my hospital appointment, my scheduled hospital appointment, in a non-emergency scenario, on a train if the trains aren't running? You ring an ambulance, so you get a lift. No, you don't. And like I well, said, you can do that to the football. Totally separate. Entities. Why can't you get a lift to the football? The clubs themselves will probably put coaches on to circumnavigate. So the football the is going to be disrupted Lynch. less. It's going to be disrupted less than the healthcare. I'm not bothered whether the football's affected at all. I'm bothered that Mick Lynch is a con man and he's a media opportunist and people like you defend him. I'm not defending him. I'm just asking you really simple questions that you can't answer. I answered them. No, I'm healthcare, sorry, that you can't answer sensibly or substantively. And train companies are not the same thing. Okay, Matt. One does have you got one a ticket? For, thing. Have you got a ticket for the game? No, I don't go to London. I don't like it because of people like you. <laughs> what if I promise to stay at home? You could literally go anywhere in London, and I'd avoid it. Okay, Matt. Um, have a lovely weekend. Love to the family. Colin's in Belton. Well, appropriately enough, Colin is in Belton. Colin, what would you like to say? Yeah, hello, James. Um, well, this is just a weird theory. Um, in, uh, you used to work in retail. This is kind of a well-known a long, thing. A like, long time ago. Yeah, I know, but, you know, you've got a memory. You'll be all right. So think about it. You do, something goes wrong. You make a mistake or you get the wrong product to your customer. 
Now, we know that customer loyalty increases when, when a company does something wrong and then they make it right. And if they do it really well, then customer loyalty increases to that brand or that organization. And it's fairly well known. What if, just bear, me, bear with me, what if the RMT put these dates oh, oh, in? Mate, I'm sorry. I just, I, it's as left, this industrial action, not the RMT. I'm sorry. No, sorry. Forgive me. I, my, my apologies. No, I'm sorry, just thinking well. of the last fella. He's, 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 he's swinging at Mick Lynch, but this is an Aslef industrial action. Oh, I see your point. Oh, yeah, but then again, he was swinging and missing, you know, regularly. Yeah. Um, so, but I, g- genuinely, just, uh, just a quick thought. What if they put the dates out and then they go, actually, because of listening to and because of, we're going to change the date. Could it be that they're doing it to just try and get greater... Um, support. Oh, okay. It's, That's it's, happened before, it hasn't it? The nurses did that. The nurses pulled back from um, uh, some action on, on, on date-based, calendar-based calculations and said we won't actually do it that day. Yeah. And I know, look, I know it sounds a bit off the wall, but it, it, I, I hope it happens that way. But either way, I'm still going to support them because, you know, an attack on any set of workers um, in terms of their Pay, pay rises or their working conditions is a tax for me on every worker in the country. And I think if everybody thought like that, then they'd all get behind it rather than fretting about... Uh, I still you know, get it, though. Like kicking a pig's bladder. No, well, I don't mock football. I, I, I still get the idea of the emotional impact of this. In fact, if the government could choose the days upon which Aslef were taking this action, then they probably would have chosen these days because it fits into their narrative of rejection so completely. I should apologise to Mick Lynch the leader of the RMT, I suppose, because this industrial action has absolutely nothing to do with him. But it shows how effective right-wing media is, doesn't it? That, that you can... Um, uh, 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 that, I mean, they're joining further rail strikes, I think, the RMT, but it's the Aslef strikes that are um, uh, driving this, if you pardon the pun, driving this particular action on these particular dates. At half past 12 is the time. Amelia Cox is here with the headlines. 12.34 is the time. Trisha Norwich isn't happy. What happened to talking about all the single ladies, James? I did my homework on it and even wrote some notes. Uh, Sheila did it yesterday and I, I felt she'd, she'd, she'd left very little to add to the conversation about, about um, people who choose to be single. Just just to be absolutely clear on, on these rail strikes. Um, 13th of May is the Eurovision final. That is when Aslef and the RMT will be out. As it stands on the day of the FA Cup final, the 3rd of June, um, uh, it is just Aslef who will be striking. So blaming Mick Lynch for that is, uh, well, I mean, obviously stupid. Paul's in Brentford. We'll talk to him shortly. Before that, Gina Davidson, LBC's political editor, is in Glasgow. We've been hearing a lot this morning, Gina, about transparency um, in the context of appointments to jobs like chairmanship of the BBC. Accountability was one of the three things Rishi Sunak promised to bring back into public life when he became prime minister. If what you are tweeting and I am reading about events at the Scottish Tory conference this afternoon are correct... um, Well, both of those words are going to have to be removed from his vocabulary pretty soon. What's going on? Yes, James, I think I think you're right. There's been a lot about transparency from the podiums as well, of course, because the, the Tories have gathered here for their Scottish conference uh, in good humour around the SNP situation, as you might imagine. Uh, and now they have a complete uh, shambles on their hands. There was an attempted um, sort of part media blackout, let's put it that way, uh, to speak to the Prime Minister after he had delivered his address to the conference. We were told that only six individual journalists were going to be able to speak with him Out of how many, Gina? How many are there roughly in the pack? Oh, there's around, I would say there's probably around about 30 of us here today. So it is more than normal because it's the conference and because it's the Prime Minister. So uh, only six uh, from various titles were going to be uh, invited to speak to him. No broadcasters at all. Uh, We asked if we could all at least be in the room to hear what he had to say, even if we weren't all allowed to ask questions. Uh, that was uh, denied initially and then we just um, refused to accept it and walked into the room where it was all about to uh, take place and they said okay that's fine that there were some cameras in there they tried to put them out and then it was said well why can't we have a a pooled broadcast broadcast clip
get at least one journalist getting mm. uh, to film the Prime Minister because, of course, obviously, uh, the resignation of Richard uh, Sharp was on the agenda for everybody uh, attending conference today and wanted to know what the Prime Minister had to say about that. Um, and there was a complete standoff. And eventually, James, they said, well, only a broadcast clip. So that would mean that the print press weren't going to even get to put their six questions. Crikey. So there was a total mutiny, um, a show of solidarity, which is not usual, I would say, amongst uh, amongst the media uh, press pack at times. And everybody said, well, we just won't speak to him at all in that case. There'll Agreed. be no coverage and the, and the coverage will be of this mess. Um, so, of course, they're, uh, ultimately um, they relented and agreed that there would be a broadcast clip and there would be the six questions and everybody could sit in and, and hear them if they wanted to do so. And then we were asked right at the end, now you can all delete your tweets that have been complaining about this they said that situation. Out loud. Yeah, it's one of the How one incredible. of the poor press officers. I must admit, I was feeling quite sorry um, for really? them by that stage. But they were, yes, they were. I don't think they'd ever um, come across. Well, uh, we were told we were being hostile, you know. So, well, it's the imposition um, of the rule versus whoever it was that came up with the idea, isn't it? Do you think this is all because of Richard Sharp? Am I, am I reading between the lines that he didn't want to answer questions specifically about that, which is why this whole debacle unfolded? I, I think that is uh, the truth of the matter, James. I don't, I don't think right. he uh, came to Scotland to speak about that. But we did obviously finally get that one uh, broadcast pool clip. And I think we can hear what he had to say about Richard Sharp's resignation. Should his replacement be a non-political appointment? And are you sick and tired of clearing up Boris Johnson's mess? Yeah, you know, what I'm doing is focus on delivering for the British people. That's what I'm here talking about today in Scotland, how we can work constructively with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. Just this week, almost three quarters of a million Scottish people received direct financial support with a help with the cost of living, the most vulnerable in our society. When I was last here, we announced the creation of two new free ports. They're going to create jobs and attract investment here in Scotland. That's what I'm focused on doing, delivering for the people of Scotland and the rest of the UK. But should the next person not be a non-political appointment? As I said, right now I'm focused on talking to people here in Scotland about what we're doing to deliver for them, most of all the cost of living. That's not That's the answer the to my question, Prime Minister. Well, should the next person be a non-political appointment? Yeah, we're, we're jumping ahead of it. There's an established appointments process for all these things, and it will be right that we turn to that when the time is right. But right now I'm here talking to the people in Scotland about what we're doing to deliver for them. So I think you could hear there, James, very much that he uh, didn't want to answer questions about that and really wanted just to talk about um, what he believes his government is delivering for Scotland. So but I think tomorrow we'll see the headlines will all be about we, this, yeah, uh, absolutely. the way the media were handled. All, yes. the, all that fuss and kerfuffle and, and, and that, that was it at the end. That was the... That was the Oh, should we even have played that out, Gina? Should we not have even boycotted the clip because it was such an abject failure to answer the very straightforward questions being asked? <laughs> there's some argument for that, isn't there? And I think there's also, you do sometimes wonder how media strategists work within political organisations because given that we had to wait maybe about an hour even just to get that, um, you would have thought maybe we'd have a new line, something to distract us, you know, something yes. else to say about um, anything to do with uh, Scottish politics, perhaps, that would maybe have uh, enabled this particular uh, story to have been played down somewhat. But that, that wasn't the case. Gina Davidson, our editor up in Scotland. Many thanks indeed for that. And, and I look forward to finding out even more detail. I just astonish you that telling journalists not, not, not that they're not allowed to ask questions. If there's one thing worse than not answering a journalist's question. It's telling them that they're not allowed to ask a question and, and they, they, they've managed to somehow achieve both of those in the space of, of one press visit up in Scotland. Um, 20 minutes to one is the time. Before I forget, Kidderminster Harriers are at home to Kettering Town tomorrow in a game that could actually see us squeak in to the National League North playoffs at the very last hurdle. So come on the lads, come on the Reds. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I am so far behind on my book that I, I can't justify I can't because I could kid myself I said oh I'll take the laptop write it on the train but you never do do you you never take my laptop write it on the train it's just never going to happen I'd probably be having a small sherry before we even got past uh, Milton Keynes so I, I, good luck kitty I, 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 I you really deserve it you really deserve it but I, I, I you know it's, it's not the despair that gets you is it it's the hope um, 12.41 is the time Paul's in Brentford Paul what made you pick up the phone Hi, James. Um, Hello, mate. I haven't changed my mind at all. I support all, all, all industries that need feel the need to strike. And my point is, James, the, the, the 
guy before was saying about Mick Lynch union leaders. There's not a trade union member now. I just need to clarify that. that, that it, yeah, it, 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 there is no RMT action on the day yeah, of the, of the FA problem. Cup final. I, I still had one eye on the Richard Sharp story, yeah. so I didn't really and remember no, to enlighten Chummo there. Yeah, there's no trade union leader that wants to see their members out of strike, James. No one does, but... They choose these dates because it's the best way that they can get people to come back to the table to them. Yeah. It's not, not done to hurt the football fan or hurt people who want to go Eurovision. It's, it's the no, you that know that. Happens. You know that and I know that. But, it, 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 the, you, you, you know, the, it, the, these are tacticians yes. that are at play here. And so is it a miscat? And, and I've been reminded by Scott, who's an RMT member, that the, uh, the, the, the union cancelled scheduled strike days for both the funeral of Prince Philip and yes. for Poppy Day. So you know that yes. and I know that. But this gives an opportunity to, shall we say, dishonest brokers and to idiots, yes. of, of, yes. of, 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 <laughs> of, who we've heard from this hour, to use it as a, a, a ignorantly, but nevertheless effectively, to use it as a weapon with which to hit the union, even if it's not even the union that's calling the strike. So so and these I'm, dates I'm are emotive. They're emotive. Yes, and I'm glad there's people out there that do realise this, like yourself, James. People, they're, they're not out to, to, to disrupt the football fan or hurt the football fan or the racing fan. It's what they need to do to make these people come back to the table to discuss what can go on. Yeah. You know, train drivers generally use a boxing day. It never really happens, but yes, they use that's true. that. That's why... It's used so that the people do come back to the table and discuss. No one wants to go out on strike and disrupt these events in, in these industries. I was a Royal Mail for 20 years. And you don't want to go out on strike and disrupt the public. But sometimes you have to use these dates to get people around the table. And it's just... And there it is. I, I mean, I, 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 we're, not, we're not at cross purposes, but they're, 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 you, you, you give the cool-headed explanation of what is going on, but the hot-headed response to what is going on may not be reachable with your words. I'm not sure. I mean, really, you're looking for someone who's got a ticket and is now worried they're not going to be able to go. We've been to Manchester. Let's hope Liverpool goes better. Jason's there. Jason, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Yeah, it's similar. Um, my mind hasn't been changed over the strikes because of the dates for choosing. Because um, last year for the FA Cup semi final over the Easter weekend, there were no trains to London from Liverpool or Manchester anyway because of planned engineering work. And they didn't so, put, call uh, it off? No, no. So as, as Mick Lynch has said in response to the question of you know turning the public against them, that the travelling public can't rely on the rail services mm. even when it's a non-strike day. So what you need to do is persuade people to care more about the targets that, that have been painted on the backs of people like Mick Lynch than to actually care about the rail service that they would argue yeah. they were trying to protect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this was routine maintenance on multiple locations up and down the West Coast Main Line last year. But it's and, been a nightmare um, for ages, hasn't it? That that coast in particular, that line in particular, coming out of... Um, it's Houston, yeah, sure. is it? Well, it, it was it was out of um, Liverpool and Manchester down to down to Houston. Yeah. So there was no there was no trains there. So two teams from the northwest playing in London. Over and it the didn't Easter happen. Weekend. So it's a bit of a pearl clutching exercise to to, to complain that this Absolutely. is sort of deliberately yeah. disruptive. I hear you. Facts versus feelings, though. That is what industrial action is almost always about. Um, a bit like Brexit, I suppose. Facts versus feeling. Here are the facts. For example, as Jason tells us. Um, it, 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 it couldn't have guaranteed a train service anyway at the best of times, even if there wasn't any industrial action. Feelings? Oh, I hate unions, I do, because the idea of workers having representation against bosses is uh, entirely alien to everything that I, I, a worker, believe in. 12.49 is the time. Um, amazing full disclosure this week. I know I say that almost every week. It's going to really stick out like a sore thumb when I don't, isn't it? But Liam Thomas is a former undercover cop uh, and he has, he has done things and been in situations that would make your hair fall out. Uh, and it's an incredible interview. He's written an incredible book. I'll give you a, It's also really lyrical. It's a poetic book. It's a very self It's an astonishing story. And, and I think I've done him justice in the interview. So I urge you to download that. I'm, I haven't warned Stuart in Northampton about this, but before we get into the reasons why he has called, I might invite him to join me in a little bit of role play in which I am going to channel Rishi Sunak. Are you comfortable with that, Stuart? Channel Rishi Sunak? I'm going, Ooh, to, gonna... I'm going to channel Rishi Sunak. What I need you to do is ask me relatively innocuous questions 
at random. So just two or three questions about anything at all, which have very little to do with the reasons why you rang in. Okay. I'll try my best. Yeah, uh, I definitely don't support Sunak. But no, I'll don't worry about... No, I know. Don't worry. Well, I don't know, but thanks for clearing that <laughs> up. But just ask me something innocuous about, you know, hobbies or, 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 or anything at all. Ask me something. Uh... Can you relate to people that don't have much money? I, I hope so by talking to... Oh, no, that doesn't work. I'm supposed to be channelling Rishi Sunak. I... Oh, I see. So you're asking me the question that you would ask Rishi. You're ahead of me on this now. I thought you were going to ask me what my favourite <laughs> colour was or something like that. Go on, try it. Let's start again. Go on. Uh, what, what's your favourite colour? No, no, do that one. Go back to the first... This is going well. Go back to the okay. first one. I, I just... I, I forgot the game I invented. That's all. <laughs> okay. Um... Can you relate to people who are on low incomes? Well, what I can tell you, Stuart, is that I am delivering for the British people, and that is really what I'm here to talk about today, and I don't think we should be distracted for that. I have recently opened 763 free ports in Northampton, and delivering for the British people is, 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 is my business. Delivering for the British people. But you haven't delivered, have you? Oh, because I'm... you you said you'd open 40 hospitals, and I don't believe even one has yet opened, have we, it? We have got more people on waiting lists than ever before. We are delivering waiting lists for the British people, and I am determined to keep delivering for the British people until all of those waiting lists are complete, Stuart. Delivering. Ah, are you going to be like your colleague Rhys Mogg and privatise the NHS? I am busy delivering for the British people and as someone who is committed to delivering for the British people, I refuse to be distracted by anything other than my determination to deliver for the British people. Deliver for right. the British so people. Do you, God, do, you good deliver at this, for, do you Do you deliver for <laughs> scammers then? And who? increase fraud? Fraud. Have you increased fraud? I am delivering for the British people. The British people are my priority, Stuart. And I, okay. I keep, I keep, I, 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 I am delivering for the British people. Delivering. British I tell you what, I, what, I'm glad that I'm not waiting for my Amazon package because I don't, I don't think I'd have, I've, I don't think I'd have received it by now. I am delivering. I am delivering for the British people. There is so much to deliver that I cannot guarantee I will be delivering for you as an actual British person at precisely the point you might want to accept receipt of that delivery. But I am delivering for the British people. Oh, can you remember why you rang in in the first place? Yeah, I can. What I was going to say on that was delivering chaos. That's what I would say. There you go. You got you. You rose to this challenge, didn't you? This is almost like oh, you were born. You hit the ground you know, running, I didn't even Stuart. Know you were going to do that, James. <laughs> <laughs> you did better than I did, which is a bit embarrassing. Anyway, go on. <laughs> um, in relation to your comments and callers yes. about rail strike. Um, I'm married to a nurse, so you can imagine my wife is very seething at the moment. Yes. She, I've got loads of friends who work on the railways. It's, it, it's a tra travesty in this country that workers are forced into their action that they are at doing. Um, the problem is that 
workers don't just go on strike because that they feel like a day off. It's because they've got families and they just want a decent pay increase and they just want to survive and support their families and basically learn to live with what money they've got. And like my wife, the yeah. weaponising of the workers and union members in this country is an absolute disgrace. I thought we'd government. made some progress, actually. I thought I thought things so were a little better than they were in previous years, but uh, but today... As, has, has, as, as my wife, yeah. I mean, obviously Mick Lynch is probably having the same conversation with his wife because he's married to a nurse of 30-odd mm, years. So I can imagine he's probably having a chat with her about his rail dispute of his RMT members and how long she probably is having a chat with him about the RCN. So, what know, about the dates, though, Stuart? The dates, are, are they unfortunate yeah. or are they necessary? Or both, uh, actually? Both, really, yeah, I would say. Point. We've got the drivers out as level on the 12th, and you've got RMT on the 13th. However, there will still probably be a service run by contingency staff, such as managers, etc. I understand from my colleagues that work on the railways. Um Drivers will still work as well on the 13th. Obviously, on the 12th, there will be no services because you'll have no drivers. So, so, And then the best-case scenario is that they get back round the table and call off the industrial action yeah. as, as a just, consequence just like, of it. Just like for the nurses, why didn't the government get round the table instead of criminalising and taking nurses to court? I ask you, but, what, what a shower of... You know what? I do know what. I do, you're a natural at this. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, you really are, actually. So thank you for playing my game uh, and actually playing it rather better than I did, despite being the inventor of it. But I'm cutting you off in your prime only because I want to squeeze in a, a, a fairly chunky clip of, of Liam Thomas. I'll tell you the name of his book after you have a little taste of this week's Full Disclosure interview. There are a million reasons why people might have thought you were suited for that role. But the, what we've touched on most is the idea that they saw someone who... And they call you the quiet fella, don't they, in mm. one of the jobs that you're mm. on. They sort of see someone who is incredibly inscrutable, somebody who is not going to get caught up in the heat of the moment or give anything away in a rush of blood to the head. Yeah. That, that, and that would come out in uniform as much as it would come out in yes. on a mission. There was, I remember, so I read when I was a submariner, that you know, the, the primary, aim, primary objective of a submarine is to remain undetective yeah. or of, of a yeah. bomber. Yeah. And that absolutely applies. So you became a human submarine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's mad, isn't well, it? Really? it? Totally, yeah. I yeah. mean, at times I felt like I'd been fired out of a torpedo <laughs> tube. But uh, <laughs> so so t t tell us about your first... Is mission the right word to use? Assignment? I mean, deployment. Deployment. Right. Well, tell us about the first one, or whatever you can tell um, us about it. The first one was... was um, one of the first firearms um, to try and buy some. I was that I was told that, um, that, that, that you know um, the intelligence was that, that this individual had access to a number of um, firearms. And what was interesting about that job was just how flawed often the intelligence could be mm. now in theory the, the, the you know the UC shouldn't be deployed and, and, until ab everybody's absolutely Copper certain type, yeah, yeah. yeah but again what I learned in terms of my that world was that's not always the case right. and there may be other agendas and, sure. and, and understandably you need to get firearms off the street so if yeah, there's yeah. any possibility but that turned out not to be so that was not exactly a kind of high powered meeting it's where you kind of sit there and think yeah, this is never going to happen. I think this fella's know. not got any guns to well, say. Well, and uh, we did get, but they were, they, you know, uh, you know, were, were probably last fired in the fourteen eighteen oh, yeah. conflict. Yeah. Than <laughs> so than Oliver Cromwell's <laughs> autograph on it, <laughs> yes. or something like that. Yeah. So, and how much of a legend would you have in, in that kind of encounter? I mean, well, you you kind of so once you became so once you went on what they call the index. Yeah. So you had That's two, the list of UCs. Yes. As it so were. you had two to so level one UC and level two. Right. You know, level twos would be concerned with sort of corner by street sort of yeah. deals, I guess. We want a better expression. And level ones were, you were as I say, you, you you could work up and down the country. You were authorised to work up and down the country and overseas. So you would, from the moment you you know you were encouraged, even before day one of your training, to have some idea of what your USP was was going to be and who you were going to be. And I thought, well. If I'm going to be good at this, I don't want to pigeonhole myself into I can just buy this one 
commodity. Yeah. And a UC that I knew and respected. It just says this is why the book is called The Buyer. Yes. That, that is yes. the, the, the yeah. modus operandi at the time to get into a criminal enterprise. Yeah. You turn up as a customer, effectively. Yeah. Generic term. Yeah, the yeah, old, yeah. So the last but it became the generic term for the whole yeah, Absolutely. Job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I knew that, well, I wanted to have a wide range mm. of, of um, possibilities. Mm. So a bit like if you likened it to as an act, be a character actor. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but on behalf of, of 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 the state, I guess. Because the people buying films of child sex abuse are not the same as the people buying large exactly. quantities of cocaine. But you want to be able to possibly do both of those. Yeah, things. yeah. And you know. So you started they're not developing. Then uh, I did. Yeah, I, um, so I started to think about, you know, what what um, background legend, as it, you know, as yeah. it's called would work for me and what would have the longevity to keep going you know to keep I, mm. you know because I don't know I think I all, already knew what, you know some s success would not be enough it had to be the best of success right. it had to be um, better yeah. than anybody else Done. that is this week's full disclosure uh, available on Global Player with Liam Thomas author of The Buyer Undercover Cop Extraordinaire and it's an astonishing story and an astonishing interview. And that's it from me. Until Tuesday, of course. Bank holiday on Monday. Tom Sawbrick with you at four. Sheila Fogarty with you now. Before 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 Sheila Fogarty with you now.